sometimes it's like what we heard from what we know was a Haran when he lost his two sons. It says by a Haran, by Yidam Haran, when something happens, there's nothing, nothing that he can say. By Yidam Haran, but by Yidam Haran is also in the mind. Sometimes it's like what we heard from what we know. Are we good? Yeah. So if a Yidam is also in the mind, sometimes people can be quiet. But the mind is so many questions, and uh, those need answers. How to deal with what's going on in our minds? Dealing with our kids, you know, somebody's going to say, "I'm not going to talk about it." The kids have, you know, stress, anxiety. They need someone to talk to. Just to sit quiet is not going to work. So we do need to talk a little bit of what's going on. On the one hand, we all need physic. On the other hand. Any chizik doesn't really reverse the clock, and we're all, we're all in pain, and we all have this feeling of how, how do we figure this out? So that's why we're here tonight. This is tonight's program, and hopefully with a lot of siyat of the Hashem should put the right words in all of our, you know, whatever we're going to say. We should be able to give chizik. We should be able to mechazik ourselves in a munah metachim, become stronger, and even though we don't know clearly what to do, but get a sense of some clarity of where we can go with this in Mitz Hashem. Thank you. Uh, beautiful. Again, we're going to do the overview of the shir, and then we'll go through some of the people that helped sponsor tonight's shir and put it together. Again, tonight's shir is titled, We're All Soldiers on the Front Line, United in a Mission to Uplift the Morale of People. What is our mission today? How could this happen? Why? Where do we go from here? Matt Shem Ali Beers here. We're going to try to ask him, you know, really what's going on on the front lines. A lot of questions people have for him. And anything, the emotional and the therapeutic parts, we brought in our in house expert, Dr. Kiva Perlman. And thank you for joining us. Um, tonight's share sponsor, first of all, by Ms. Rabbi Mrs. Gold, who said they wanted because they heard Ali Beers coming on. They have children in Israel. They said they're going to sponsor a nice amount of money to the United Atsala. Matt Shem, after the Shem, and will send out the United Atsala link. Everybody who could ship in, obviously, the the, the Tsarich is tremendous. It's also somebody sent me an email. They have a child, Yitzhak Yudah ben Khan, a comic soldier right now is in, on the Gaza border. And they want to share to be as close for them and should be safe. And they had an older son who passed away 13 years ago, Il Nishmas Tesach Tzvi ben Khan, on his 13th yard site. And um, we're going to go first now to Yochum Palter, who a uh, very close friend of ours. And he has an amazing program, Fresh Start. And he put together a uh, program. He's going to speak about it very short for people that... Yochanan, take it away. I'm not going to give it away. I am here. Thank you, Ushi. Okay, we're going to make this, uh, hold on here, let me just... You're good, we see it. Okay, you see it, okay. So we're obviously all here to hear Dibra Chizik tonight, so I'm going to be very brief. Moments like these are unprecedented and tend to stir up a lot of strong emotions, feelings, anxieties that may have been dormant for years. I'm sure you're going to hear more about that uh, from Rabbi Kiva on this. But Fresh Start is here to help call Yisrael to manage and heal from trauma, both past and present. In light of the current ongoing challenges in Eretz Yisrael and around the world, Fresh Start invites you to a transformative four-part webinar series to provide practical tips and expert guidance for self-regulation during times of crisis. The webinars will be moderated by Rabbi Shimmer Russell, Rabbi Avram Bleich, and will include Dr. Ken Adams, Dr. Janina Fisher, Dr. Ruth Lanius, and Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. To learn more and register for this free webinar series, please visit jewishfreshstart.com. And we'll post the link in the chat. And with that being said, Ushi, I hand it back to you. Okay, take off, take off the screen share if you don't mind. I will do that. Stop share. Okay, I want to do one more thing over here. Um, something that's very close to me, Menachem. We're going to talk about uh, Adirai Terra. Adirai Terra is a tremendous organization that helps make Terra in yeshiva's learning. And as we know, the ultimate school for, for, for class is always Terra. And um, they're running a campaign. Anybody who wants to chip in a dollar a day or anything just to be part of thousands of people that are learning Torah all day, which is always Matzah Klai Yisrael. And all this is the biggest school and anybody could be part of it. Whatever you can give, it doesn't make a difference. Just be part of Torah. Menachem, say something about Adir Torah. I don't have much to say. Talk about thousands and thousands of people sitting and learning. And like the headlines tonight, we're all up front. Everybody has a mission. And uh, some are running around with their guns, with uh, doing what they need to do. Others sit and learn hours and hours straight, and and it, it's all needed. So if we have a schos in both, you could send food to Chayalim and send a few dollars for the people that are learning. 
Okay, now we reached a thousand, we're maxed out. Anybody who's here tonight, that's 100% sure not gonna ask a question. We're gonna get very little questions tonight. Please go now to the yeshiva.net, Rabbi Huawei's website is streaming live over there. And you could watch it over there. So that will let more people come in and I'll keep on trying to throw people off of the Zoom onto the yeshiva.net. The, the yeshiva, T-H-E, T-H-E. The yeshiva.net. Yes. Sorry, the yeshiva.net. So anybody who can sign off the Zoom, go there. It would let more people come in and give more chizik for people that want to hear tonight. Um, people are texting me all the time. They can't get on. So please, again, one more time, go to the yeshiva.net. Rabbi YY, I'm going to give you a whole bio and read your all introduction, your whole life history. But I decided at this point, whoever doesn't know you, it's just too bad on them. Rabbi YY, take it away. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to everybody. I think we have a few thousand people on now on all the various platforms. So welcome to everybody. Bruchim haboyim b'shem Hashem. There's an expression in Yiddish, an old expression, as a shver tzereden, a besenach shver tzereden. There are moments in life when it's very difficult to speak. And one naturally just wants to remain silent. One naturally wants to remain in their own cocoon with people that are very close to them, to feel more cozy, more connected, more intimate. But it's sometimes even more difficult to be silent. This is not one of the shiurim or lectures that I or any of my colleagues aspire to or, or pine for. This has been one of the most, uh, you'll forgive me if I uh, break down at some point, but this has been one of the most difficult weeks for the Jewish people. As many have said, that since the Holocaust, literally since the Holocaust, which means we're talking about eight decades, there has not been so many Jews murdered in one single day. As this year, Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah, Shabbos, October 7th, 2023, 50 years after the Yom Kippur War. And, uh, you know, some of us talk a lot about generational trauma. We thought we're talking about generational trauma that we're dealing with from previous generations. Nobody in their worst nightmares thought about, you know, the living trauma the pain and the grief in the Holy Land this week is unfathomable. More than a thousand families sitting Shiva. More than a thousand funerals. Think about the families shattered and crushed. The families of the wounded. You're talking about almost 4,000 people wounded. You're talking about more than 1,300 people killed. And then you're talking about more than 100 in captivity in Gaza. They and their families, and all of Israel, and all of the Jewish people the world over. We're all reeling. Anyone with a heart and a soul, and every Jew has a heart and a soul, has been touched this week to our core. And thus we're coming together tonight because it's obvious. What was Hamas's plan besides murdering Jews, torturing Jews, abusing Jews, the plan was to strike fear into the heart of the Jewish people, to demoralize our nation, to demoralize Israel, to inculcate us with dread and panic. And therefore, an essential part of the victory and of the fight back is to lift the morale of the Jewish people. In Eretz Yisrael, on that dark morning, they all read Parshas V'zoy Sabracha, for us, it was Shemini Atzeres. And they read that Pasuk in the last parsha of Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu speaks moments before his passing, and he says, Ashrecha Yisrael, Mika Moicha, Am Noisha Bashem, Mogin Ezrecha, Shecherev Gavasecha, V'yikacha Shuevecha Loch, V'atal B'meseme Sidrech. So Rashi writes, and I quoted it, I put it down there, I wanted to quote the words of Rashi. After all the blessings to all the Shvatim, amazing, powerful, stupendous blessings, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ashrecha Yisrael, Achesh Aparat Lehem Abrachas, after he specified all the blessings, Amar Lehem, 
Mali lifrit lachem. Why should I get specific? Klal davar. Hakol shalachem. The summation is, it's all yours. Ashrech Yisrael, micha moicha. So I want to share with you a little story that happened this past Thursday. For me, it's very meaningful. I heard it from the person, uh, person who was present. This happened at North Carolina University, and N- N- NCU. I have a friend, a colleague, his name is Rabbi Zalman Blooming. He's the Chabad Rabbi and Shliach at Duke University and NCU. Sadly, sadly, this is also unfathomable. There have been demonstrations this past week in universities across America protesting against Israel and blaming the atrocities on Israel. It's horrific. It's so sad. It's so sad because you have Jews at these demonstrations. So there was a demonstration at NCU against Israel. A Jewish professor in the university who is secular, very secular, and liberal, and atheist, heard about it. But he's a Jew. He's a human being. He has a sensitive heart. He has a basic morality. So he was outraged and he came running to the demonstration and he started to shout on top of his lungs, yelling at the protesters that they sound like Nazis. They're talking like Nazis, celebrating an organization that is so overjoyed to murder and burn Jewish babies. You're like Nazis, Nazis, Nazis. The police escorted him away from the demonstration, supposedly for his own protection. He went back to the university and then it was time for class. So he came into his lecture auditorium and he sat down or he stood up to give his lecture. And before he begins, a young woman studying in his class comes over to him with a bouquet of flowers and she presents it to him. So he asks her, what's this? So she says, I wanted to tell you how proud I am for what you just did outside, that you stood up for truth, you stood up for life, you stood up for love, you stood up for decency, you stood up for humanity, for heaven's sake. I am so proud of you and I was so moved by your behavior and the fact that you lost yourself. I wanted to show you my appreciation and gratitude. So here's a bouquet of flowers. So he looks at her and he says, you're probably Jewish. She says, no, I'm not. So he says, so why do you care so much? She says, because you're the chosen people. He looks at her and says, you have been in my class for a while. You know that I don't believe that. She looks at him and says, you may not believe it, but we all know it. In the darkness of this week, we also saw something else. We saw Ashrecha Yisrael Micha Moicha on two levels. First of all, the hate. May the Pasuk says, show me who hates you, and I'll tell you who you are. When we are the people that Hamas hates and wants to see every one of us dead, it shows us who the Jewish people are. When your greatest enemies in history are Paroi, Haman, Nebuchadnezzar, Stalin, Hitler, Hamas, this means we must be such a good and holy people because of evil despises the Jews more than anything else. Evil is very, very sensitive to its antithesis, to what threatens it. When we see who despises us, who hates us, if people who are capable of such barbaric, sadistic, inhumane evil, and to dance, to dance for it, to celebrate it. And they are the ones who hate the Jewish people. For them, we are their greatest threat. A little Jewish baby represents a threat to their existence. They gleefully want to murder her or him. What does this tell you? You belong to a people that embodies the deepest goodness and holiness and sanctity and morality and love and compassion and divinity and beauty and ecstasy in the world. That's something we need to celebrate. And when you look at the response of the Jewish people this week, when you look at the outpouring of love and grief, everyone who's reeling from pain know why you're reeling in pain. Because you care, because you love your people, because you love love and you hate evil and you love goodness. Don't repress that pain. That pain tells you, So my dearest brothers and sisters, 
The bottom line, I think, or at least one of the bottom lines is this is a time of a lot of pain, but a pain that needs to help us and guide us and elevate us to become the best version of ourselves, to understand what was targeted, who was targeted, why were we targeted, and thus to understand that at this moment, our calling, every one of us, is to lift up our morale as Jews, to inspire ourselves, to inspire others, and to live the best and deepest version of ourselves. There's no question that every Jew was called to war last Shabbos. Every Jew was summoned to a battle. Every Jew is now engaged in a war, but a war has many divisions. Tzivus Hashem, God's army, also has many divisions, like every army. The question is not if you were drafted. The question is for you and me to be able to ask ourselves, what division have I been drafted to? What are my skills? What are my talents? What are my resources? What is my shlichus? What is my unique mission? Everyone is a soldier on the front lines today. But I have to ask myself, what division have I been drafted to? What is my mission today? How will I help my brothers and sisters? Lift them up from the abyss. Lift them up from depression, from demoralization. Inculcate myself, my children, the people around me with fortitude, with resolve, with confidence, with courage. Times of war are horrific, but they can also bring out a clarity and a decisiveness that is unparalleled. These tragic events have touched us to our core. They can allow us now to respond on a core level, not superficially, no external layers, no babamysis. You know, babamysis is part of life, but not now. It gives us an opportunity to crystallize to ourselves and our children who we are, what we live for, what we stand for, what is Israel, what is Eretz Yisrael, what is Yiddishkeit, what are the Jewish people, and therefore why Hamas wants to destroy the Jewish people. And every one of you, some of our front, some of us belong in our homes with our children. Some of us are in a base medrash, some of us in shul, some of us have jobs, some of us are on the front lines, literally, some of our children, some of our nephews, some of our relatives, some people may be tuning in. Some of us are drafted to different divisions, but everyone, everyone, Shema Yisrael, Atem Kravim, Ayam Lamulchama, as the Kayana Mashiach said in Parsha Shaifta, you have been drafted to Mulchama. In a war, there's a lot of pain. It's not easy. But, Altiru, the Torah says, don't allow fear and panic. Now it's easy. I can't just snap my fingers and say no fear and panic. This is an inner calling within myself, within yourself, which we're going to try to help each other throughout this evening to be able to reach this space, this place of opening ourselves up to the unique calling and opportunity of our mission right now at these critical times for Israel and for the Jewish people. I think, I think we should hope. begin. We have here Eli Beer, who is, as you may know, the founder and the director of Hatzalah in Israel. Uh, Eli, can, uh, his own history and his own story with founding Hatzalah and his own journey is quite fascinating. But it's now 4.30 in the morning for him, or almost uh, 5 o'clock in the morning for him in Eretz Yisrael. And we have here Eli. So I think we should begin with that, because here's somebody who's always on the front lines and been on the front lines, I think, from the moment he heard the call. So, uh, Eli, can we begin with a few questions? Good morning uh, from Eretz Yisrael. And it's uh, a great honor to be with you on the same podcast. And uh, I'm sorry it's in this uh, circumstance. I wish I wish it was in better circumstances. I'm Hanukkah, we lit a Manaira together in, in Mamila. <laughs> Yes, yes. We lit the Menorah together. Oh, love. The truth is, I came because of you. 4.30 in the morning to go on a Zoom call, you need to be Mashuga. But you're, all, a Meshuggah, you're a Meshuggah. certified Mashuga already for many I'm, years. <laughs> I'm the chief Mashuga here. You wouldn't have but, founded Hatzala. We know the story, you know. When, when, when <laughs> Ellie tried to work with, uh, you know, bureaucracy to found Hatzala in Israel, and I think somebody told him, you're a 16-year-old little Shmendri. Go back to Yeshiva or go get a job. So... Uh, Anyway, but it's an honor go to be here. Go open a falafel stand. Go open a falafel stand. Go open a falafel stand, yeah. So you decided to open 2,000 falafel stands, but not serving shawarma, serving uh, life. Yes. Um, so where were, you when, all, when, where were you when the attack happened? When? How did you find out about it? What was your first 
feeling your first response. I don't know Start if you could share that. everything, but uh Captain and this tragedy in Nancy's role. Every and I want to say there is right, there is no Khiloni, you know, Karedi. We all feel first time in years. Francis Roll, like I never saw any this is something I never never in my life saw as one. I saw left wingers or always against the government. Now in the front lines, I met I met Golan, who was the head of merit, general in the Israeli army. He hated dying in the right wing part, head of merit, very left wing. Is done, and he says, "Fighting for peace, and there is time for." And people fight life. We have two volunteers of United gave their life for. We're unfortunately we away in a very very brutal way, trying to save lives. It's it's it was for me. It's ten thousand volunteers in United Hotel. So one, but they. It's one unit, one family, and this Shin Bet volunteer. He worked with for Shin Bet, worked for different things, lived in Kremlin, and he was within within minutes, and he was the hot seller bag. He came with everything, and he took out his gun. Was able to Rabbi Eli, kill the like, Rabbi Eli, you're like a little. Yeah. Really, like a little choppy, a drop choppy. Do you know why that's happening? I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me better? Let's see. Let's see. It's like background. Noise. So I'm saying the situation. It was. It was. It was Nisi many floors. This whole event was one big nest. I must say that we're looking at the tragedy and we're seeing so many people gave their lives. So many people died. So many people injured. So many people were captured. There's still people who are in. Who knows? Over a hundred people, for sure, are kidnapped and and captured and and probably are tortured by the Hamas. But this situation could have been ten times worse because they were planning to come to Yerushalayim. They were planning to march up to Harabais. That was their plan. And something big nisim happened. And I want to talk about the nisim today, not about the tragedies, because we all know about the tragedies. The tragedies. We're all over the news. CNN wrote about it. CNN spoke about it. Every 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 newspaper wrote about the tragedy. But I want to talk about the Nisim. They have a little city called Tifrach. If you know Tifrach, it's right next to the Tivot, next to Ofakim. I don't know if you know about what went on in Ofakim. That terrorists here for 24, 24 hours, terrorists were in the city taking over homes. Tifrach has thousands of, of firm families, of, of Families have yeshivas there, seven or eight yeshivas. Every yeshiva is full of the yeshiva boys who was dancing for, for Simcha's Torah. Think about the disaster that could have happened with thousands and thousands of students. Not one of them has a gun. These were going on there, and they didn't, not even one person got hurt in Tifrach. It was right next to everything. They somehow skipped, they passed by Tifrach, and they didn't go in. Think about the Nisim that we had. Somehow these these terrorists got distracted with money. They started, it's unbelievable. These guys came to kill Jews and they were all about killing babies, killing women, killing everyone. They saw credit cards of their victims. They started shopping in, Ru in Russian, Russian websites. They started shopping in Russian websites. Can you believe it? This is unbelievable what they were doing. They, 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 they got distracted. They could have continued to other and other cities. Israel was not prepared for this. I am very proud of thousands of volunteers of United Hatzalah who left their homes at 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, and rushed down to help out the people who were in trouble, people who needed help, thousands of, of victims that we were treating. People were injured in, in very difficult situations. My wife, Gitti, who is a tzaddikist, she left Yerushalayim. We left, we all together for, for Simcha's Torah. And she left Yerushalayim. She went down there. She's a paramedic. She was able to 
save at least 40 people that she saved with her own hand. She was there for 36 hours straight, treating people under fire. She was in Shteirot, missiles were flying above her head, and she heard bullets next to her ear. And she continued working together with other heroes. Where were you? And it's unbelievable were the you? Nisim that we had. Where were you, Ellie? I was in Yerushalayim. We were all together in Yerushalayim. And I was woken up at uh, seven, sorry, six forty. We had a volunteer. His name is Chaim, Rabbi Chaim Sasi. He was driving. He was going to shul. He was. He had a talis on him. He was going to shul on Road. He lives in Road. He's used to missiles. He's used to everything. He doesn't get excited from it. And all of a sudden, he gets a call on the hot cell radio that they have a shooting in the in the police station. So he runs back home. He jumps on the ambicycle, and he starts driving towards the police station. When he gets close to the police station, he sees the fire going on, the, the shooting. He takes out his weapon while he's driving that Sela ambicycle. He holds it. He's a, he's a, he's a dying. He's a dying. He's not a young guy, like 20 years old. He takes out his weapon from his right side, and he points it towards the first terrorist he sees. He, he hit four terrorists. One of them he killed right away. Four of them he injured seriously. Then he felt a bullet in his arm and his face and his leg, and he fell off the ambicycle. While he was down on the floor, he fell off the ambicycle, he called for help, and that's when they called me already. They said, he said, we have 25 terrorists here in, in Shteirot. Once they called me and said 25 terrorists in Shteirot, I knew something is bad, because Shteirot, they have to pass through other villages to get to Shteirot, other Yishuvim, other Kibbutzim. Then we heard the missile attacks, and then we heard other, other, other attacks. We had another volunteer, in in uh, in Kfar Aza, who was yelling for help, he said terrorists are everywhere. So I knew already the situation is really really bad. I didn't know it was a war. I thought a few terrorist groups came in. So we all got up. My whole family's in Atzala. My wife, my kids. I have five kids in Atzala. My son's in the army. My son's in the special forces now. So right away, I'm like we're all like running everywhere. I ran to the Atzala station in Yerushalayim, the main headquarters. And I, we have 10 dispatchers at night, 10 dispatchers. I knew right away they're not going to have enough dispatchers. We were getting phone calls from women and people crying on the phone, save me, save me, we're hiding in the attic. It sounded like a movie. It sounded like I'm in the Holocaust Museum in, in Yad Vashem. They were hiding, in, Jews were hiding in the attic. And they were asking us for help. We couldn't, we couldn't send troops to help them rescue them because it was too dangerous. But then that moment, Am Yisrael came together. I, I can't explain to you. I had people running to that cellar station with Talesin from shuls everywhere. It looked like the Yom Kippur War, like pictures from the Yom Kippur War. Hundreds of volunteers with Talesin. They were just taking keys for ambulances, jumping on vehicles, and just riding down south. They didn't know where you're going. And they just went straight into the fire zone. They're running in to save people, rescue people. We had 1,700 volunteers who went down there. I managed the dispatch center of Hatzala. We right away called for 60 more dispatchers, all from Jews, all came from shuls from all around, from Gimachol, from Romeima, from Matristov, everywhere. They just showed up and started picking up phone calls, phone calls after phone calls. It was all the same phone calls, terrorists are outside of my house. All the same phone calls, terrorists outside my house. But once in a while, you have a phone call of someone with chest pains. You have to treat them too. And we had, that day we had, we were treating 2,500 victims of terror, of war, people who were seriously injured. And we had 1,900 emergencies that are not related to anything. So all this we had to manage in one place. Wow. We had to open the bomb shelter. It was it was a chaos. But Baruch Hashem, I could say that United Atzala was ready because we always practice that something could happen, a war could happen. We always do practicing. Never thought it would be such a magnitude of a situation where we would have this. It was never even in our back. Or like it wasn't even a it wasn't even an option. But unfortunately, we suffered so much. But I'm I'm so proud of everyone in Amis Royal, and I think this is the only way to win. Is Achdus. And and I think you'll agree with me that I think that the fact that we weren't, we didn't have Achdus and we had Sinas Chinna for so long. I'm not even talking in a mystical way. I'm not even having nothing to do with mystical, nothing to do with Amuna. It's practical. The Goyim, these 
these anti-Semites who wanted to kill us were looking for the right opportunity. They had Iran behind them. They saw Am Yisrael in the weakest situation where Jews are hating Jews. A, a, a Jew wants to daven in Tel Aviv and Yom Kippur, people are fighting him. This guy is fighting. It's, it's everyone's fault. I'm not blaming one side. I'm blaming all of us. We didn't fight enough for Ahava Shina. And what happened was 6.30 in the morning on Shabbos, Am Yisrael came together. And I really, really hope that I feel, I hope you feel this in America and you feel this in Europe. I feel it and I'm walking around Eretz Yisrael. I'm walking in, the, in, I see it in, I was, today I was in Kfar Aza. Kfar Aza was the worst of the worst. 60% of the population were murdered in the worst condition. I don't even want to describe how it was. But you see people coming from everywhere, from Eilat, from Bnei Brak, Hasidim, Litvaks, Chabad, everyone walking into Kfar Aza and looking how to help. People just want to give. People want to do. People give cookies, give filter fish, herring, whatever they can do. They're, they're giving out. People are just feel like it's about time after so long that we weren't loving each other. It's about time we should start respecting and loving each other. And I really hope that this is not temporarily, but this will be a long Ahavas Yisrael situation. And only then, only then, this might take six months, this situation. We are ready, ready for six months. We are preparing ourselves for a six months war with, with Hamas and with Hezbollah and inside Israel. We have so many enemies inside Israel, unfortunately. Yeah. But I know and I have hope. I'm here in Israel. I'm not leaving. I'm not going flying to Miami. I'm staying here. My son's in the front lines in Gaza. He's, He's there, and I'm Gaza. not worried. Your son, the is, reason about... Gaza? Your son is in Gaza? My, my son is on the border of Gaza. He's in the special forces, my son. He's practicing for two years for a situation like this. And now even more, the last few days, only they practice. They're practicing all day. The outside of the border, they have 350,000 soldiers there. 350,000 Israeli soldiers are out surrounding the Gaza Strip. Besides for another 150,000 up north. So we're talking about almost every family in Israel feels this. Wow. And I'm telling you, as an Israeli, as an American also, but a Jew, I, I never thought I'll live through a situation like this. I never thought I'll see a mini Holocaust. That's how I look at it. I went into, I went into the, to this Barry. I saw it. We had a volunteer. His name is Shalom. He's a Hasidic guy who made Aliyah from, from England a few years ago. Shalom made Aliyah. He's a little pay is going on the sides. He went in with the special forces, with this vest, with the, with the bulletproof and the helmet. The special forces went into Barry, it took Faraza to rescue Faraza. He went in with them and he heard a screaming of a babies. Babies were crying, babies. They found after 16 hours, the babies were laying in bed crying for 16 hours because the parents were murdered. The mother went out to, from the shelter to get milk for the babies and they shot her. I don't want to even say what they did to her before they shot her. You could imagine what these Chaleris did. These Chaleris are the worst of the worst. They, they went and they did whatever they did with her and killed her and then killed her husband. And the two babies were left sleeping in the room. I don't know how they didn't find them. Shalom found them 16 hours after. They were starving. They were crying. Six months old twins. And Shalom said to me when he was holding the baby, he felt like he's rescuing a Jew from the Holocaust. That's how he hold the baby. Took the bottle. He made him a bottle. The baby, one of the babies, another Hatzalah volunteer, hold the second baby, and they gave the baby water. The baby didn't want to leave the bottle alone. He was so thirsty, he dehydrated. Then they gave him milk or whatever it was. They made him. A, they made him from the same sink that the mother was laying on the floor. They made her food for the baby because they didn't have any other chance. The baby was starving. Two babies. And that picture was in the front lines everywhere in CNN and everything with a Hasidic guy holding a baby. What a kiddush Hashem. A Hasidic guy running in with special forces rescuing Jewish kids in a kibbutz. In a kibbutz. This is the Am Yisrael that I want to be part of. This is the Achdus that I want. This is the Ahavas Yisrael that I want. I'm begging I'm begging every day. I was doing this United Atzala. The reason I changed the name many years ago 
from Atzala to United Atzala is because we put everyone together. We have secular Jews from the kibbutzim with earrings. We have volunteers with tattoos everywhere, and we have volunteers with Shreimach and Spudiks. All together in one organization, and two volunteers of ours died. Guess what? One of them was a Israeli secular Jew who was a Shin Bet guy. The second one was an Arab from Nazareth. And he was tortured like the Jew. They tortured this volunteer because they saw he was wearing a hot solar jacket with 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 this with the state of Israel's flag on it. They took him and they tortured him. We took after four days, we found him. Only after four days. Another volunteer of ours who's an Arab Israeli a doctor in Soroka Hospital. He stopped to treat the victims because he was on the way to work. The, these terrorists caught him. He started talking Arabic to them. They shot him in his legs. Then they realized he's an Arab. They tied him to a, a light pole and they made him look, watch on how they're killing all the Israelis. And they said to him, you are our protection that when the soldiers come, they won't kill us because you're here. And they tied him to the pole. He was there for nine hours tied to that pole. Luckily, he wasn't shot because the shooting was going between the soldiers and them. He was right there, standing there. He is suffering. He's a lover of Israel, this, this guy. He lover, he's a Bedouin. He served in the army. He served in the Israeli army. A lot of these Bedouins serve in the Israeli army. It's unbelievable. Everyone feels it here. But the most important thing out of this whole thing is this was, like you said, this was the worst day the, the biggest killer of Jews since the day of uh, since the Holocaust. This is worse than Yom Kippur War because Yom Kippur War it took weeks till this amount of people kill, were killed. Weeks, in one day, over fifteen hundred people, over one day, and how many more people will die? People were captured. But my hope, my real hope, that we will all get chizuk. By the Achdus, by the Avas Yisrael. And this is what I want. This is what I'm praying every day. And I'm asking all of us in Am Yisrael, in America, you see another Jew, smile to them. Give a nice word. It doesn't matter if the Jew has a beard or has a yarmulke or nothing. Just smile. Make, we need this. This is the only way we could survive. Wow. How are you dealing emotionally with all of this? Personally, emotionally. Well, I feel destroyed. I really, I never, I say 10 days ago, I was another person. I didn't smile for 10 days. My wife, myself, my kids were just thinking of what we saw. Um, I hear stories. I hear other volunteers talking. All day, that's what we're talking about. This is nothing else we're talking about, not sports and nothing else. And it's very hard for us. But we know, I tell everyone, we have a responsibility. We can't break. We're like soldiers. We are soldiers. We can't, cannot break. And we have to continue. And we have some miracles. Just two hours ago, next to my house, at 1.30 in the morning, not far from me, a lady called Hatzela. She's She felt like that she's giving birth. Two Atzala volunteers arrived from the from the women's division and delivered a baby, baby boy. And you hear these stories, it makes you, you know what? Good things are gonna happen, Mr. Shem. A lot of good things are gonna happen. We just have to be in the Muna. We can't break. That's what the Hamas wants. That's what Iran wants. Iran is behind this whole thing, and we all know that. And this was not a plan by the Hamas. Hamas are not, they don't have the seichel. Hamas, a bunch of lunatics, rapists. That's what they Ellie, are. Ellie, I want to ask you a question. For all the people that are coming here tonight, and I'm just telling you as a personal feeling, there's such a feeling of mixed emotions of fear and what's going to be and the news. And, you know, right now we feel like America is very, you know, pro and, you know, about, about President Biden really spoke amazing when he gave a speech and they seem to be very of now of Israel and they see you know they seem to get the, get it clear but we all are just like inside like scared of what's going on in Israel and how the anti-semitism is pouring across America you know the stories that are coming out the protest being there and seeing what's going on like what what could you tell us give us some physic over here um, it's a different type of physic over there you're dealing with live terror over here we're dealing with like fear you know, of the unknown of, of you know 
We're just sitting back and watching it like 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 I'm an outsider. What do you tell all the people worldwide not in Eretz Israel? But what should be our mindset? What are we supposed to think? Well, in ten days ago, when this thing started, I was I was devastated. I was sure we're get, we're losing the country. You know, in some points, if you go back in history, fifty years ago, Golda Meir thought after the second or third day that the country's over. She actually thought that the Egyptians are going to catch her. So that's what I felt. And then I want to say, and I'm going back to what I said before. When I saw the Achtos, I knew we we're going to win. And everywhere in the country, you see signs now. It says, Yachad Nenatzeach. Yachad Nenatzeach. It's all over the country. If you think about it, it's such a powerful saying. If we're together, we can go through this. It doesn't matter if you're in Lakewood. It doesn't matter if you're in Borough Park. It doesn't matter if you're in Los Angeles. All the Jews together will win all our enemies. We won 1946, five after the war. Look, the Jewish people came out of the worst situation. Six million Jews were murdered. And look at us today. I think every single one of us has met family members who were murdered in the Holocaust. And look at the Jewish nation. Yes, we, we got the worst thing that we could have imagined happen on Simchas Torah by us. Simchas Torah t- turned to a name of a war. It was Yom Kippur, now it's Simchas Torah. It turned to a name of a war. But I really believe that it brought us back together. Unfortunately, we were going, we were going in the wrong direction for the I mean, last I few watching, years. I was watching on the news. Shabbos in Manhattan, one of the biggest shuls in Manhattan, which is basically not so from, they had videos, the shul, there wasn't a seat in the shul. I feel it. The amount of love that we feel, people calling me and sending me messages and people apologizing when they're calling me, you know, they know we have a war. People are supporting. You're not going to believe the amount of love and support that is coming, not only to, towards the United Atzala, of course, every yeshiva's organizations are getting pouring love and people realize that it's about time that we really have to really care about each other. It's not about ourselves. It's about all of us. And I think this is the best message that has to come out of this whole thing. Lakewood and LA, Bar Park and Philadelphia, we're all together, every Jew in the world, no matter who you are. And you have some people who are more from or less from or not from. But the terrorists didn't choose who's, who they're going to kill and who not. They killed everyone. They killed all the Jews. And so many miracles are going to, you're going to hear about a lot of miracles coming out of this whole story. Lots and lots and lots of miracles. I hear them all the time. Look, this could have been 10 times worse. They were planning to come to Yerushalayim. You know how many tours they had in Yerushalayim for Simcha Star? Hotels were packed. There were no police from Shteirot to Yerushalayim. There was no police. No police. Maybe one cop for us, for people who were speeding. They would have gotten a few Hamas people who got a speeding ticket. They had no security in Israel. It was a disaster what was going on. It was something that unheard of, that Israel should not have the army prepared. And the reason they didn't have anything prepared is because they were busy fighting with each other. That's the truth. They were not thinking about our enemies. We turned ourselves into the enemies. And now I think we realize, look at this, Benny Gantz is sitting together with Bibi Netanyahu. And, and hopefully, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to be. We're going to fight for a while, and, but I really feel that we're going to win because Am Yisrael, Chai Vekayim, like we say, and we're, we're here for staying. We're not leaving anywhere. And we're people willing to give their lives for it. Look at this, 350,000 soldiers down south. People are running. People are coming. I don't it, know if you saw them. There was chartered flights from L.A. There was charter flights of people that flew there. They had a charter flight left today with 300 people. People are begging to come to fight. People want to come protect the country. People want to come learn here. Not only fight. People want to come learn Torah here. People want to support. People want to do good. And it's really showing the good face of us. I had children. My daughter today. I'm just going to tell you a beautiful story. What in, in Ofakim was a terrible situation. A lot of people were murdered and hostage for 20, 25 hours. And one of the Atzala volunteers is a girl. Her name is Penina. And she, she was devastated from this whole thing. And after she finished tweeting, 
uh, victims and her and our other volunteers, she came over to me through, a, through the head of the, the of Fakim division and she said, she called me up and she, she was crying on the phone. She says, I'm supposed to get married Sunday, today. And she and they cancel all the weddings in the South. No weddings, no events. And she said, I don't know where to get married. I don't have money to make a wedding. I don't I said, don't worry. We're going to make a wedding for you. We had arranged a hot seller wedding for her in Yerushalayim. Um, Danielle Renov, she's a peace, peace uh, love and carrots. She's, I called her up. I knew she knows how to arrange things. She found a hall. We found a caterer. We found this. My daughter, Adina, was 15 and a half years old with her 10 friends, came to, to wait to do the waiters. They were waiting for, for cleaning up, setting up the place, giving people the food, and then cleaning up after. And this is all volunteers did. It was achus. And then when people heard in Shara Chesed that they have a wedding of someone from Shtero, uh, from Ofakim, and 500 people showed up to the wedding to dance in the shul that they made the wedding in. It's just showing the love that people want to give to each other. Yeah, Ellie, I want to turn to another topic, uh, and I want you to be part of it also, Dr. Perlman. The bottom line, we, me, and I'm talking for probably other people as well, how do we deal with our emotional, not to get wrapped into it? There's like this, I say, I'm, I'm talking for myself, everybody could do whatever they want. There's that feeling of, okay, we're starting the Muhammad's Goyga Mogig, and Shiach is coming. There's the feeling that this is World War Three. There's the feeling the Holocaust is starting. There's a feeling of extreme excitement at one side, on the other side, extreme fear. And then, of course, the million dollar question, the children from my my six-year-old listens, he, he turned on Alexi, says, tell me the news. He knows exactly what's going on. Okay, he's a little advanced, but 16 straight through. I mean, how do we deal with this? How, how are you dealing with this? Just let's talk, let's, let's talk about it. Uh, first of all, I think like everybody else, my emotions are all over the place. I think I started every single meeting this week uh, with I apologize in advance if at some point I start breaking down because my heart is with you. My, my spirit is with you. I'm right here, but I'm also with our people. And to be with our people means that you're carrying their pain. You're feeling them. You're alongside them. I, I just want to, the basic answer to that question, Usher, and, and Coach Menachem as well, Rabbi Waiwai and Ellie, and all the most amazing people in the world that are here together. This people is- People here just tonight, just letting like, you know there's somebody from Mexico, Argentina, we have everybody live here from around the world. Continue, mm-hmm. sir. This is the biggest part of our healing. Not healing, because we're still in it. We don't know where this fight is going to take us. And I think we need to, st- to shift a little bit of the way we think about anxiety. We're always thinking about, how do I ground myself? How do I get okay? How do I do that? And I think what we're seeing is the best way we could do that is to convert that into action. We'll talk a little bit about it soon, some research re- with regards to that. And I think here, getting together, I think if there was a way for us to do this every night, to sit and look at each other, to see... I can only do it once a week. I don't have a whole week. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a time and place for everything, and it could very well be that we need to do this more than once a week right now. So we could see each other, and we could connect for a moment. I know I had on Friday night. Um, usually, I know it's a time to recharge for many of us. Um, but you can't, you can't sit in your own skin. So I walked over to my sister's house to spend some time with her and, and her husband and family. And we just, we laughed together, we cried together, we shared stories, we disagreed, we fought, we shared our anxieties. And I know that both of us at the end, just a big embrace with a lot of tears in our eyes. I just love you. I care about you. You're my brother. And it's such an honor to be on this journey alongside you. And I think that's what we're seeing. There's nothing like like every once in a while we get a patch, we get a little reminder that all we have is one another. And I think in the beginning, if you look at even just this week, what it looked like being in America. It was like the, the beginning, you heard words from the president, you heard word, words from some others. It was amazing to see how quickly the narrative shifted. It was supportive. How could people do this to the Jewish people, to the, to, to the state of Israel? And then very quickly, it became restraint. It became an eye for an eye. It became everything else. And I think it's been horrifying for, for most of us to see that when you're driving down the street and there's someone that you're not so familiar with or even a neighbor that you know, how does this person think about me? How do they see me right now? If let's say they're from a different denomination, different religion, how are they looking at me at this moment? It became truly terrifying. I know for me, I was sharing with family that I'd feel safer in Eretz Yisrael because at least I know I'm with my family. I know what I'm up against. And over here, there's so much silence. There's so many looks that you're getting. I had already a few times this week just driving on the highway 
you know, every once in a while when you're in traffic, you look at the car next to you. You try not to make too much eye contact, but every once in a while you do, you have a moment of connection. And this week I had at least four moments of disconnection where you just catch eyes with another human being. And instead of there being like just a, a polite hello, nice to acknowledge your existence, nice for you to notice me, there was like a look of disdain. There was a look of fear. And I remember sitting in my car, I think it was the first time in my life, I actually experienced fear being in this country, a real sense of fear, like what's going to be. And I know it's something we need to attend to. I, it was a story, my, my first day of internship. And when I was studying to become a therapist, my first day, first or second day, I forget, was 9-11. That was my training. And I was working at the time in a, in a locked unit in a psychiatric center. It was called Hillside Hospital, connected to LIJ. And I remember the, 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 the patients in that unit. Obviously, these are people who've been through a lot in their lives. They've struggled a great deal. But the whole focus of their experience in that moment became personal. It became singular. They all needed a great deal of medication just to like settle themselves down. And I was thinking about that in contrast to who we are as a people. When we suffer as a nation, we come together. It's not just, a, it's not only about us as individuals. And yes, we're in anxiety. And I wish I could say, do this and you lose your anxiety. We could talk about things you could do to, to ground yourself, to connect. But at the end of the day, we're, we know that we're going to be in a state of anxiety because it's an anxious time. We know that there's time, there's a time for anger, there's a time for love, there's a time for fear. And this is a time where we're truly afraid. No one here could predict the future. But we know that we're, when we're together, we're strong. When we're unified, we, we become one singular people. And to see that happen, like in all these stories, Ellie Beery sharing the most beautiful stories of what it means to, to, for Claudia Stroll to come together, that's the greatest Yeshua that we have. There isn't, there's no tricks of losing, letting go of that anxiety. I think we need to talk to our kids openly. It's something we need to, we need to say that we need to give kids a language for what's going on around them. They need to have the ability to ask, to, to get some degree of clarification, give them a language that's appropriate for them, that they could begin to align their inner world with their outer expression. So we don't have this fracture that could start early on. And then just today, I was sitting with a person who went through a lot. He had an experience in his life early on, deeply, deeply traumatizing. And I think for anyone who's close enough to trauma, they understand this idea that because he wasn't able to integrate that experience at that moment, and you start, you see that fracture beginning, you know, it began at a very early stage in his life, but here he is as a married adult, still living with that fracture, still holding on to that. And the best thing we could do, I remember asking him, I said, did you did you share this information, this experience with your parents? Did you let anyone know what you went through? And like most people who've been through any degree of trauma, the answer was you get like a blank stare. There was no one there. There was no one to talk to. There was no one that I could share that with. And when we think about our kids today, they see us. They know what we're going through. They know that the world is slightly chaotic at this moment, and that we're living with our own sense of uncertainty. We're on edge. And we need to find a way to explain to them in their own words, that is appropriate for them. And like you said, Usher, you have a child who's possibly a little precocious in a beautiful way, and I'll use it those kochas to, to bring great healing to our people in the future, God willing. And it takes a lot of courage to, to stand up, and he's showing those signs early on, which is amazing. So he might need a different language than someone who is a little bit more withdrawn, a little quieter. But either way, we need to start thinking about what is the inherent language, what is the internal language, of my children and how could I find a way to reach them in that place so they don't have to absorb it, they don't have to hold on to it, that they know that there's just like us as adults, what are we doing all day? Aside from watching the news, we're communicating with one another through WhatsApp and yet children, because they don't even have words to express what's going on, they don't have that ability to share with one another and we need to give them that ability. We need to be those people for them. We need to give them an opportunity to express what exists inside of them. And, and hopefully that'll, that'll give them that strength to stay aligned. And I think with ourselves, it's really the same. There's a lot of research, if, if, if I could start a little bit. Um, there's a lot of research when it comes to how do you prevent trauma? And the irony of this, by the way, is that most of this research emerges from Eretz Yisrael. 
because it's a community, it's a, it's a country that lives in a state of trauma. So a lot of the most relevant research that we have on trauma, on PTSD, on what, what, what this does to people when they experience things that they can't integrate into themselves, um, it all comes from Eretz Yisrael. And I could imagine so much more will emerge from this as well. We'll be able to learn from it. But number one, there was a, a study that was done with Israeli soldiers after they experienced the loss within their unit. And they gave them options, two options. They said, option number one, you could stay close enough, close proximity to your unit. You could process it with them. You could stay along with, with whatever fight that they're in. Or option number two, which is certainly appealing, and I think it's appealing to us as well as adults, is that you could go to a place, get some rest, be by yourself a little bit, go to a hotel, go to some, some spa, rest, find, your, find yourself again. And then they followed those people for many years. And they said, who was better off? Which group of people ultimately did better? And what they found overwhelmingly was that first group of people, the ones who got to stay with others, the ones who had the opportunity to process it. I know that this is a, and it's hard to say this, but this is a, a, we have some people who open up their cameras, but I know that for myself, when I have an opportunity to see people, especially now on this screen, I see a few people that I know Shana was a student, and I see some others that are just people that mean so much to me in life. And when I see your face, it gives me a sense of connection. It gives me a sense of, I'm with you in this journey. I'm alongside you. And, and there's a purpose that comes along with that. When you stay engaged, you stay connected, you have the opportunity to mourn alongside one another, to share in the struggle with one another. Um, and this is a moment where it's, it's frightening. It's frightening to share this with one another, but we need to. We know that trauma is defined. It's really defined by any experience that we don't have the opportunity to integrate into our system. It's beyond us for whatever reason. And I think it's fair to say that this is an experience for all of us. It's simply beyond us. And so there's going to be an impact. There's going to be a ripple effect. And I wish I could say, do this, it's gonna go away. But I think we all know we're all wise enough to know that this is a moment where the best we could do is to have a moment like this, to share with one another, to love one another, to accept and embrace one another, because that's, that's what we're here for. And to experience those moments together uh, by doing, by engaging. I was speaking to my sister. I have a sister in there, it's um, She has her son and her son-in-law are both on the front line. They're right there, ready to go. Uh, my, my, my dear nephew, Gabriel, he was a part of that unit, that base that was attacked. He had just graduated from the army a few months ago, and that was his base. That's where he was stationed. So most of those people were his undergraduates. And for him, the opportunity to say, I got to do something, it wasn't even a question. It was like, I, this is my duty. This is what it means to be a Jew. This is what it means to stand together as a people. And my sister, she, she has the ability. I'm like, I don't believe I'd, I'd be capable of doing this. Um, but she's doing the taharas, and she's been she's part of the Hebra Kadisha, her and her husband, and she's doing the taharas. Hard to hard to even say this of of the holy brothers and sisters who perished, and she's describing scene after scene of what is that like to. She told me one thing. She said that when you put you try to piece together a person because you want to present it to the family so they could bury them with dignity and respect. And she said, they're asking questions. Is this, is this the, the top of the body? Is this the bottom of the body? How do we do this? And that's what she's facing. But because of her strength, because of who she is as a person, because she's, she knows that it's her children that are on that front line, and she's sending them there with fear and apprehension, but with pride that this is, these are our children, she's doing her part. And we need to do our part. Every one of us, like Rabbi Wawa was saying, that this is our shlichus. One way or another, we're being called upon to do something. I know even today, like showing up here, I don't believe I have a lot of words to share. I don't. I just want to be with my brothers and sisters. That's the only thing I could do. I don't even like the fact that there's a doctor and a PhD. It's irrelevant at this moment. What's relevant is that we're here together and we're one big family. That's what matters. And we show up when someone calls upon you and says, it's time. And to see the chesed, to hear the stories, my son's yeshiva. I have two boys in Eretz Yisrael who are learning. I can't tell you how proud I am of them, that they were, I want to be here. I want to be in Eretz Yisrael. This is my shlichus right now. It's my way of fighting alongside my brothers. 
and sisters is that I'm going to learn from my people. I'm going to learn extra hard from my people because that's my way of showing up. That's what I could do right now. But there was a, a battalion that reached out to one of my son's yeshivas. And they said, we need to raise an exorbitant amount of money in a short period of time in order for them to get vests and helmets because we're not fully, fully prepared for this moment. And it was literally a matter of hours where they were able to raise, I think it was like $170,000. These are just 18 year old boys making calls to their friends, to their family saying, what could I do? And just an opportunity to video call my son and to see that the passion, to see how alive he is, to say that I'm doing my part for Kali Yisrael. And that's what it means to be a Yid. And so we say that we, you stay in it together. The best way to, we can't inoculate ourselves against fractures that emerge inside of us. It's not, we don't have that ability. But the best way we can in this moment is to find a way to contribute, to find a way to be close, to find a way to, to do our part, whatever that might be. And for some of us, it's saying to Hillam. For some of us, it's learning a little bit longer than we normally do. For some of us, it's literally sending tanks to another country, which I've literally got a call from a guy today. Do you know if you could get a tank to Eretz Yisrael? And I'm like listening to the guy on the phone. What are you talking about? But the honest truth, that's what he's working on. He's really working on getting a tank because they need it. There's, there's some group that needs a particular type of tank that they don't have. So they're working on getting it. They already priced it out. They already found the people that are that that make it, and they're trying to figure out how do we get it there. And finally, they got in touch with the guy who runs DHL, and he says, "I'm willing. I'm willing to take it. We'll find a way to get it there. You get me the tank, we'll get it there." And all I could think is, "Mikam Chaysro, who's like us? Who's like us? Unlike any other people, you know. We see in 9/11, we came together as a country, no question." But to see Klal Yisrael coming together like this, no, no matter how we look, what we do, how we dress, how we interact, what our approach is to Yiddishkeit, that we're one big family. And I think the fact that we see the outside world responding the way they do, it almost to some degree forces us into this space. Yet we embrace it because that's what we do. I want to share a, another piece of research that they talk about. And again, this is something to think about, and I know there are different opinions on this, but I'm just speaking about it from a psychological perspective. This was research that was done after 9-11. And I think most of us know um, that we were just, just drawn to our devices or whatever we did to, to, to observe what was taking place, to see an airplane flying into a building and see people jumping out of buildings. It was something that because it's so different and so novel, something that we're drawn to, something that we like. But we know that, that they, they discovered afterwards that the people who saturated themselves in these images, they really just watched it over and over again. And I think there's a psychological need for us to do that. It gives us some degree of control, some degree of mastery. We know what's going on. We're aware. And it allows us to feel like we're doing our part one way or another just by observing what's taking place. But they found that when, when people internalize too much information that they can't truly internalize, that there's like this residual effect, there's this lingering information that we, we don't know where to place. And it's something to think about, that we all know our line. I'm, I'm a sensitive soul. And for me, I know that, I, I, that if, you see, if I see something, I'm going to have a really hard time unseeing it. I don't think I ever will. In the middle of even my sister talking today, I said, please, I, I so deeply appreciate hearing some of the stories, but you know who I am. I can't hear all of the stories. Share with me some of your experience, but not every aspect of it, because I know that if once I hear it or once I see it, I'm not going to be able to unhear and unsee it. It will stay with me. And for some of us, we have the ability to integrate it. We need to know who we are. Um, but for some of us, we don't. Um, and Thanks, I want to I want to turn a little bit now, a little bit, because a lot of people are asking, Ellie, we ask you, no, no, we're good, we're good. Can we, can we get a little bit into like Hashem and like a lot of people are having just a hard time with them talking about Ellie, I want to start with you if that's okay. Like people are texting all the time, like, you know, like how do we deal with, we believe in Hashem and Hashem's this and Klai Yisrael. And then we watch, you know, one thing we learn about the Holocaust, we watch videos. It's most of us already, it's more of history than it is reality, you know. But when we see what's going on, it's people being butchered and slaughtered and we dive into Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. But we're Yidin, like, how do you, you go there, you see this. How do you internalize it? How do you deal with that? How do you connect? I love Hashem, Hashem loves Yidin. Then you see what's going on. How do you, it's contradictory. Oh, well, listen, I, I, uh, 
when I was a kid, I had a, my bar mitzvah was in seven by eight. And uh, I don't remember the whole parsha by heart. But, you know, Hashem gave us a choice. Hashem gave us a choice. You know, you, you could choose bad and good. And Hashem gives us a recommendation to choose v'charta batov, the man t'chiyata v'necha. I don't, I don't remember the whole, um, it's almost six in the morning. I didn't sleep for a couple of days, but I remember my father explaining this, this to me when I was a young boy. My father grew up in America. And when he was 10 years old, he was raising money for Vada Hatzalah then to save Jews from the Holocaust. And I asked my father, how did you stay religious after this? After you heard how many people were murdered, how did you stay, how did, and six million Jews were murdered. How did you stay from Believing in Hashem after all this, and he told me the parsha I had was really, um, you, you, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Yy could actually help me out here, but because I'm like very exhausted, but really, the, Hashem gave us the human beings the choice to be good or bad, and Hashem really gives us the Torah that we should follow. These are the steps you should do to be a good person, a good Jew. Here's a Sarah Sadibros. Here's a 613 mitzvahs. And we have to follow them. If if a group of terrorists, a group of Nazis are, are doing bad, we have to do more good. We have to influence the world more. My father said he every day after, after Yeshiva he used to go to Torah Vadas. Every day he used to go raise money to save Jews from, from Europe. And he felt so good with himself every single day when he got a few dollars and he said hand it over to the organization. And after the war, he said, maybe I should have done more. He didn't think of being angry at Hashem. He knew the Nazis were the bad people, and we were the good people. And it's all about us educating our children, our families, to follow their HaTorah. The Derech HaTorah is very clear. You see someone, no, it doesn't matter if he's Jewish or not Jewish. You see someone who needs help, you go help them. You have to help Jews and non-Jews. You, have to, you never want to kill people for nothing. The, these guys, these terrorists, they they do exactly the opposite. They choose the the the, the bad. They choose doing good bad, and it doesn't. I actually say that it's it's really nothing. It's all about us and our education. I'm not blaming Hashem for the Nazis, and I'm going to say I don't believe in Hashem because of that. Hashem created the world. Hashem follows everything that's going on, but Hashem gave us a direction. I really think that after seeing what I saw this last ten days. I believe in Hashem even more. And I want to go in His ways even more. I want to follow the Torah even more. I want to make sure my children follow the Torah, my grandchildren follow the Torah, to be kind to each other. That's the Torah. That's, the, that's what Hashem asks us to do. And if and, and this gives me more Muna than ever. Eli, how many terrorists came in to Israel? How many? Over 1,500. And how do you explain that for so many hours there was no response? So let me explain, first of all, how it works. In the border of Gaza, they have a big army base, very, very big army base, that they are all the cameras, the most sophisticated cameras, all the, all the, you know, the borders are protected. If you touch a border, automatically the camera's going on. This was planned over a year, a year and a half. What they did is they sent drones with explosives on it. They had dozens and dozens of drones at six o'clock early in the morning. What the soldiers were used to seeing in the last few years, farmers, Arab farmers from Gaza would come close to the gate. So they had a lot of farmers come that day. They didn't realize that was weird. These farmers were not really farmers, were all terrorists. And what they did is they sent drones into the army bases and they blew up and killed soldiers, lots and lots of soldiers by drones. And these soldiers were overlooking the, the computers. Most of them were murdered by these drones. Then they started shooting missiles into Israel. So everyone, when they hear missiles, they run to shelter. And that's when all these farmers got up with the machine guns, started shooting at the, at the soldiers that were on the border. And they started coming with tractors, knocking off the border. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them were just coming in with jeeps, four by four, you know, uh, pickup trucks with guns on it, and like thirsty to kill Jews. And the, the, 
the, no one was waiting for them. The truth is, it was a big surprise for everyone. And I'm saying again, this was one of Israel's worst failures. And I'm saying, admitting this, I, I'm an Israeli. You know, we all love this country. We failed. We failed, and I say it again and again. We failed because we're too busy fighting with each other. If we were not fighting with each other, we would think about how to secure Israel better, how to fight our biggest enemy, which is Iran. Iran are the Hitler of this generation. These are the Nazis of this generation. They sponsor. It's like you're sitting now. I don't know where you are now in America. But you're sitting around thinking how to do good in the world, how to give light in the world, how to support and do good things. It's sitting there, all these guys with the long beards, these Khomeini guys are sitting, how do we kill more people? And this is what we were supposed to be busy with. We were supposed to be busy with that. Somehow the Yetzirah is so powerful. Yetzirah always says, let's speak Lashon Horror about each other. Let's do bad to each other. Let's find why the second person is not good. And Hashem, unfortunately, got us, you know, I, 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 I think this is worse than the Yom Kippur War, no doubt. Much worse than the Yom Kippur War. It's not even over. It's just the beginning, Rabbi. We're just in the beginning now because now we have to clean up the mess. Do you feel and the Israeli leadership, do you feel, Ellie, that the Israeli leadership honestly has the courage to create the sustained efforts necessary to do what they have to do in terms of Hamas, well, Iran, Gaza, Hezbollah, and the enemy inside the state of Israel? Do you feel deep down in your gut that our leadership, political and military leadership, has the courage, resolve, and even clarity and confidence to do what they have to do? I know now everybody's angry and, you know, China, Biden is supporting, but I'm talking about, you know what I mean, down the line, you know, when CNN... Oh, I don't want to be political other here. Images. I don't want to be political here and, you know speak against any political figure in the end of the day <laughs> in the end of the day sorry this is my my life for the last 10 days i don't feel well but the the end of the day we we have to give support to the leaders here although if we like them or don't like them we're in a war now we should not even say lashon horror about our leaders because now we have to hope there was no elections now we have no choice uh, I feel like 10 days ago, they were doing a terrible, terrible job. Terrible job running the country. Terrible. And I was embarrassed of what was going on here. It was everything against what I always preach. And I think Simchas Torah at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, when Bibi Netanyahu for the first time went on television and started talking, he realized the big failure this country went through, and he was the leader of the country. And he called for Achdut, and he called Benny Gantz, he called Yair Lapid. Unfortunately, Yair Lapid did not join. He called even Lieberman, who we all know his opinions, and no one's a big fan in this crowd with him. But he called him, and, he, and Benny Gantz, who was, a, who was a chief of staff of Israeli, of the idea, joined Bibi Netanyahu for the government, which I thought it was an incredible thing. And I really put a lot of hopes, and I think we have to daven, all of us, be makabal on ourselves to daven, to give tzedakah, and do chesed, and give hope that these people will have the right direction. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should help them out, find the right derech to win this enemy, because this enemy is more evil than the Egyptian enemy. The Egyptians were planning to kill. You remember, you're, you're young. I was born right before the Yom Kippur War, but I read every book on the Yom Kippur War. The Egyptians wanted to kill every Israeli, throw them into the ocean. But once they realized they're losing, they decided to, to, to make a ceasefire because they were surrounded with Israelis. Yeah. And they had no choice. We thought we we're losing, and then everything turned around. And I really think that in this situation, the Hamas are very different than the Nazis. By the way, the Nazis also didn't want to die. The Nazis, the Germans, wanted to build the empire of the German empire yeah. worldwide, but they didn't want to die. Once they realized they're dying, Hitler shot himself in the head, and the Germans wanted to make peace. 
These guys want to die. Yeah. How do you fight two million people who want to yeah. die? I don't know. Yeah. So Hashem has to give Bibi Netanyahu and Benny Gantz and everyone else involved some kind of chokhmah that I have no answer for. How do you win an enemy like this? Wow. I saw an interview with a Hamas leader on one of the stations, and he said the difference between us and the Jews is, he says, they are weak because they want to live. They cherish life. Ali, I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. That is unbelievable. The rabbi is unmuted? Yeah, let me do that. Rabbi, why am I unmute? Oh, I'm sorry. No, this guy said in the interview, the Jews are weak because they love life. They cling to life. They'll do anything to live. We are happy to die. We want our children to die. They die a martyr's death. They go to heaven with 72 pies of pizza. And I'll tell you something. That was what, that was what Golda Meir said. That's yeah. what Golda Meir said. We're never going to have peace with the Arabs until they love their children more than they hate us. Right. I don't know if you have this answer, but people, a lot of people are texting it. It's a, it's, it's a question. What people want to know is, at the end of the day, are there hope for these hostages? Are we, are we trying? Is the, is the goal trying to really save them, or we're just we're more focused on, you know, really the getting rid of the Hamas? It might not be a question for you, but it's just a lot of people are texting me this. Look, I think as an Israeli who has children here, we all have tremendous tsar, tremendous tsar, on every single person that was captured by the Hamas, and we know that their condition are, you can't even imagine how bad their conditions are. And that one that one father was interviewed, I don't know if you saw the interview in CNN, he said, he's so happy his daughter died and she yeah. wasn't captured by the Hamas. His 15 year old daughter was murdered. And he was so happy that she died and wasn't captured by the Hamas. These Hamas people, first of all, they are monsters, shit. Like, I can't understand people who are protecting, even Palestinians. Are you guys out of your mind? You want to live under Hamas? Look what's going on under Hamas. These guys are murderers, are, are, are thieves. I don't want to even continue, but they are the worst of the worst of human beings. All they're thinking about is the, 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 the fun of killing people, even their own people. So the, the, the people are protecting them. It's only because they hate Jews, so that's why they're protecting them. Even Europeans, they see protecting them. They hate Jews, so they're protecting them. I, I personally think that we, we have a challenge here. We have to really work hard for the next few months and kill the heads of the Hamas, their families, and everyone. And if Chas was shown, these, these people that were captured, Israelis, Jews, were captured or, or, or we can't we can't think of them because we have the whole country to think of. I don't know. It's a shaila halachically. I don't know, but the shaila should you blow up the whole Gaza and you have a hundred people who are Jewish there? Because if you blow up the whole area, you might save a lot of Jews in the future. I think you can't negotiate with them for sure. You can't negotiate with them. It's a big shaila. What's going to be with them? And Israelis, most of the Israelis, they don't even say it, but they think it might end up terrible. Bro, I want to turn the question back to you, back to the Hashem and, you know, the, the million dollar question. How, when we hear all this, how are we supposed to be machazic ourselves and really pull ourselves together in a, in a spiritual sense? And I bring up a side topic. I know nobody wants to answer the question, but do we, are we supposed to think about this is really Saif Yama, this is really the beginning of, of Saif Dallas? Is this what we're holding? Listen, you're asking the question of all questions. Yep. It's the greatest and profoundest question of history. You know, where is God when innocent people suffer in this way? You know, when you read Tehillim of David HaMalach, you know, we, we read Tehillim in Hebrew and many, very few of us understand the rich poetry of, of Tehillim. But if you understand the Kapitlach of Tehillim, it's extremely comforting because David HaMelech and the other nine writers of Tehillim, they express there the pain and the disappointment and the grief and the sense of despondency and loss from all the suffering and anguish that David experienced and the Jewish people experienced. And he yells to Hashem and he screams, you know, and 
you know, he screams at him, and yet God is also the source of comfort. So it's like almost a paradox, like, you know, you're screaming, where are you and how could you allow this? And if you're so good and if you're so compassionate and, and Elo, Rosh Hashanah, and Kippur, Sukkot, and Chastayla, like what happened with, with Anna Hashem Eishia and Anna Hashem Atzlichana? And, 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 you know, you read the Nevi'im, it's, by the way, just I'm, I'm smiling because it's important to remember one thing in this entire tragedy, and that is we have been around for 4,000 years. Our nation has sadly, sadly, sadly seen incomprehensible atrocities, not just in the generation of the Holocaust, we're talking about for thousands of years. And it's just important to remember that we are here to tell the story. So everybody should just know what the end game is. The end game is we're winning, we're victorious. We're gonna come out triumphant. There's a Navi, the last Navi of the Jewish people was Malachi, the prophet Malachi. He has a line there. In the name of Ani Hashem Loi Shanisi Ve'atem B'nai Yaakov Loi Chilisim. Hashem tells me to tell the Jewish people, listen, you're going to die? Maybe, but they're going to have to kill me first. <laughs> Once Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah finishes killing God, then they'll be able to kill the Jewish people. As long as they don't kill God, Atem B'nai Yaakov, you're not going anywhere. So if you ask, you know, where are the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and then all the way back to Hitler and Stalin, and the answer is, they're gone. The empires are gone. The Jewish people are here. So that's the end, the end story. You know, Am Yisrael, as Eli said, Am Yisrael Chai is not just a slogan. It's not a cliche. It's not just sung in Kennedy Airport, which is beautiful. It's in the DNA of the Jewish people because it's in the DNA um, of... Amalek is also still here. Amalek is still also Amalek here. Amalek is still here, like the Torah says. Machay timcha zecher Amalek, melcham al Hashem ba'amalek midar dar, midar dar. But like we say, Chayla Advakayim Lenetzach. It's just important to understand that we are Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishaka. The Navi says the eternity of the Jewish people was never a question and never will be a question, despite despite the incomprehensible loss. So there is a paradox here. On one hand, we turn to God and we pray and we daven and we cry. Where are you? Why? Madua Da'ir Chishayim Slacha. La Maria Yisalam Azah. Shevet Chalatz Le'asim But by the way. The greatest believers in Judaism, Avram Avinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, Yirmiya Navi, David HaMelech, Iyai Velio, quite great believers, asked these questions because the pain is so, so overwhelming. And yet, their very comfort came from that very same God. How does that work? How does that work? Does it make sense? And the answer to this is, is very simple and it's also very profound. And that is, why do we believe in love? Why do we believe in love? Why don't we, if the whole world is a random error, it's a random mutation, okay, people die, there are murderers, there are killers, good and evil, it's all relative. There's no real absolute. Why are we so obsessed with our hatred towards evil and our love for love and compassion? And the reason is because love and justice is in the DNA of the universe because there's a God who's good. And that's what's entrenched in our systems. So we have to remember that our entire experience of love and compassion comes from the source of love and compassion. If you don't believe that at the world, in the world is a source of love and compassion, then this whole thing is just our own imagination. So the very emunah, that makes us cry out, why is there so much pain in the world, tells us that the core of love and compassion is coming from a place much deeper than my mind and my heart. And therefore it brings me also to the next conclusion. And that is there's no way that our finite brains can wrap themselves around the mysteries of life and the mysteries of the Jewish people. When you hear about what happened, if I try to assimilate it into my brain and try to understand it like I am trying to understand a Svari, a Svari in Gemara or a Bakivege, and I try to make sense of it, one of two things happen. Either it forces me to numb and detach from my emotions, or my mind becomes completely mashigan. There is a moment where I have to tell myself, I don't understand. I don't have to understand. When Rabbi Akiva, when the Malachim saw the fate of Rabbi Akiva, and they said, Zu Torah v'zu schara. Hashem's response is, Shtoik, silence, kach Allah b'machshava. What type of response is that? Silence. 
Let's think about it. Their question wasn't only about words, it was a question about thoughts also. It's a place where the human mind, the human thought, the human experience of what is love, what is goodness, we just don't comprehend it. And therefore we cry and we're vulnerable and we roar. So our refuge is in God, who is the essence of love and the source of love. But we don't know exactly what that means. We understand about Hashem and His journey and His plan and His infinity. As much as a plant in my garden who's watching me embrace my child or give something loving to my child, how much does that plant experience the emotion of love? The plant is a plant. We don't, the whole vocabulary of the divine completely, completely transcends us. And yet, that is our only, that is our only source of security. What is my source again? I once heard from Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel was in Auschwitz. And he said, he, I heard this from him once. He said he was once by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And Elie Wiesel struggled with God terribly, like so many survivors. He wrote a book called Night, in which he writes some very, very powerful, powerful feelings about how he lost his God in Auschwitz. He saw a child hanging, or it's, I'm not going to get graphic here, but in his book Night. And he, he said this, he said he was once by the Rebbe, and at some point, you know, these are two very educated, intelligent people. He said, I looked at the Lubavitcher Rebbe and I said, how do you believe in God after Auschwitz? And he said that the Rebbe was silent for a few moments, very pensive. And then he looked at him and he said, in who do you want me to believe after Auschwitz? You want me to believe in human beings after Auschwitz? If there's any faith left at all in the destiny of mankind, it's only from something that transcends the ego and the mind of mankind. That was the response. We are torn, we are shattered, and a maimin, a muna doesn't mean that I'm naive, I'm numb, I'm dumb, I'm detached. A muna means that despite everything, I want to believe and hold on to something that is eternal and that transcends my ego, it transcends my emotions, transcends my mind, and is a source of ultimate love and security, even if I can't explain it in rational equations and rational terms. It's the belief, it's the belief that each one of these Jews who were butchered to death, their life is not over. The Hamasniks were killed, and the Jews who were killed, they don't have exactly the same fate. Without God, they have exactly the same fate. They're dead. They're finished. Hamas is dead. The Jew is dead. No difference. Bad Muslim, wrong place, wrong time. Faith means, no, that their life, Hamas, Hamas took their bodies, their life, their consciousness, the fact that they're part of the divine truth, which I can't see with my eyes, and that's why we cry for them, is, is, is not over. And it also means, faith also means, that goodness will prevail, love will prevail, unity will prevail. That's what Mashiach means. Geula means that our job is to make this world a place of truth, a place of love, and that we're going to succeed with it. And it's a choice everybody has to make. The choice, Amun is a choice in many ways. It's a choice that comes from the deepest part of the soul that says that I want to hold on to the fact that all our trauma and all our pain for 5,000 years was not just the mockery of evil, sinister monsters who get power and can do whatever they want. Yes, there are people who choose that philosophy, and I will never judge, because pain is pain. But this is the power of Judaism. This is the power of the Jewish people. And I know in my life, I know what I want to choose. Let's go to a live question. You're on. Hi. Okay, my question is, um, I see the outcries all over um, from the world out there against Israel um, about their, I guess, um, the way they're treating the innocent Palestinians, the women and children. And I know there's such a thing as collateral damage and war. My question is, A, for ourselves, like, you know, we are a compassionate nation. Like, how do we justify that? To ourselves that we are also causing suffering to innocent people and like we're not like hamas yet we are 
you know, in, inadvertently causing the suffering? And B, how do we answer the world? Like, you know, when I see all that, and like, I feel like I want to respond, but like, what do we respond? It's a great, I'm great question, like Rebbets and Esther. May I respond? So I, I want to ask you. I want, I want, I want Dr. Perman also to respond after you, okay? Sure. Okay, no, 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 go on. <laughs> Marks will be in it. I'm waiting for Rebbe Wawa, please, share. Okay, okay. Rebbe Wawa, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So Esther, okay, I'm it's, signing it's, off. I'm signing off. it's a wonderful <laughs> question. I just want to say one thing. It's this question that has inculcated so many Jewish leaders with such weakness and an inferiority complex that according to natural circumstances is responsible for so many of Israel's mistakes and failures over the last few decades. You know, let me ask you a personal question, right? If you are chas v'shalom sitting in your house with your beautiful children and somebody is shooting, shooting with a bullet and each bullet is killing or maiming another child, chas v'shalom and you want to kill the person who's killing children, but there's a problem. And that person is using a human shield. That person is living in a house. If you blow up that house, there may be children. So the question is, what do you do? What is your moral responsibility? To allow all your children to die or to take down the enemy and blame him, him. He's the one who started the shooting. Not one child would have been harmed in Gaza. Somebody tells me, a liberal Jewish friend, very, very hard left, he says, you guys have a strong army. Gaza has nothing. They have, they have Hamas, a bunch of losers. Of course they have to kill Jews. I said, you know what Gaza has? Gaza has a country nearby who doesn't want to hurt even one Palestinian child. Let me ask you a question, my dearest open-minded moral friends. What happens if Hamas goes on vacation for three years to Hawaii? Does Israel shoot? One rocket, one missile to Gaza. Does it kill one Arab child? No, everyone is left peacefully to take care of their lives. What happens if Tzahal, if IDF goes on vacation for one week? Will there be one Jew left alive from the 6.6 million Jews in Israel? We don't have to go back. There was a Second World War, a Holocaust. Do you know what what jerk what? America and Britain did to Germany in 1945. Read about what happened in Dresden. Read about what happened in Berlin. Read about what happened in Munich and Frankfurt in 1945. There were a lot of German casualties. Who do we blame? Churchill? America? We blame Hitler the monster. He started a war. He's responsible for the Germans who are dying. We're blaming Israel? for trying to protect 6.6 million Jews who would be slaughtered, then Rebbe. using human shields and Israel is at fault. Rebbe. It is when moral, the- moral insanity. When they went to the World Trade Center, America flattened Afghanistan. There must have been hundreds of thousands, if not millions of innocent people that got killed. Of course, you never want to target an innocent person. Which Jew, which Jew wants to target one innocent person? You could count on your hand. Jews who want to target innocent people. (laughs) Instead of Hamas is brilliant. They know that when they use human shields, the world is going to gang up against Israel. (laughs) Instead of gang up at Hamas and say, you are thugs and criminals and Nazis and monsters, and we will never tolerate you. Israel surrenders to the stupidity of a world who couldn't care less if there's another Holocaust. And says, yeah, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. We're a moral country. A moral country means a country that defends its citizens unwaveringly and unequivocally. And it's this mindset, forgive my passion here, but it's important. It's this mindset that has crippled Jewish leaders for decades now because we are a compassionate people. Sadly, not sadly that we're a compassionate people, sadly, that we confuse authentic compassion and understanding when compassion causes much more pain to the cruel. More Arabs have died. More Arabs have died because of our appeasement. Churchill said, I quote Churchill, appeasement is feeding the alligator in the hope that you will be eaten last. Sadly, since the Six Day War, Israeli leaders with good intentions have embraced the path of appeasement. In 2005, 10,000 Jews were thrown out of their homes in Gaza. Jewish graves were undug. 
to be able to give our neighbors a beautiful Palestinian state in Gaza. I say to you, I'm not a politician, I'm not a military man. Israel's greatest mistake was the moment that Hamas shot the first missile from Gaza into Israel, Adrik Sharon should have stood up and said, I made a terrible mistake. I thought I'm giving you a state. You'll build universities, hospitals, schools, gardens, farms, use our greenhouses, beautiful, you have the Kush Katif, beautiful greenhouses. It was a paradise there, paradise. Use it, and then the whole right wing would have been numb. The right wing would have been proven wrong because look, we gave them a Palestinian state, and look, life is flourishing. Instead, we said, ah, another missile, another missile, another missile. We allowed a monster, a Nazi monster, a raging cancer to grow and grow and grow and grow. Every few years, we had to send in a few people and lose more and kill some of their own children instead of having the unwavering clarity and say, terror is a raging cancer. Either you eliminate it or it eliminates you. Welcome to 2023. We did not eliminate the cancer. Okay, so the world is saying it's been our treatment of the Palestinians till now that made them come out. You're saying it's the opposite. It's really the fact that we had too much Rahmanis instead of... Of course, we're harming their kids. It's a Rahmanis on the innocent Palestinians. Hamas is a Nazi regime. Do you know how they suppress any dissident in Gaza? Do you know the torturous methods they use for their own dissidents, for Arab people? It's a Rahmanis on them. Mm-hmm. And to, to, to relinquish our right to protect Jews, men, women, and children. Let me, let me remind you something, and Ellie, forgive me if I'm wrong. If Hamas had an opportunity, what they did in Chastaira, they would do every single day of the year, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, and they would have some Chastaira every day. They would do this to six million Jews. They would burn them and torture them and rape them and and mutilate them and murder them every single day. The only reason they don't do it every day is because of God's grace and because of our army. What happened to Chastaita would have been a daily occurrence. It's not one time, it happened one time. They would love to do it every single day. That's who you're dealing with. So if you leave one, one cell of Hamas intact, you are literally inviting the next round, let me tell you something. What we saw, I don't like to use these words, but I'm talking from their perspective. What they wanted to show us was a preview of their movie. Their real movie is, Ellie, what's their real movie? Real, this is a preview. Their real Our movie. and killing every single Jew. Every Jew, the 6.6 million the Jews to embarrass Hitler, to show Hitler that they can do a better job. That's their movie. This was a preview. So what? And this is the beginning of their uh, they their plan, Hamas, ISIS, the Muslim Brotherhoods. They want to conquer the world. They're going to go to Europe. They're going to go to England, France, Belgium, Sweden. This is going to be in the last in the next 20, 30 years. If we don't eliminate it now here in Israel, if we don't fight this cancer like you said, and eliminate them and destroy them, this is going to be every country in europe and hope and uh, i hope never but even in the united states canada and other uh, other countries you can't have rahmanas and evilness like this it's like when the nazis were fighting in europe no one said why are you hurting so many germans the poor germans yeah, look at these yeah. poor germans you're killing so many german kids no one said that no one said that when we went to when the americans were bombing isis in syria and iraq no one was thinking, oh, these poor ISIS kids, how could you kill them? Hamas is exactly the same as ISIS yeah. and worse than the Nazis. Mm-hmm. And we have to educate ourselves and not have Rahmanis, not on their children, not on their families. We have to eliminate Hamas. And unfortunately, 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 their children are there. If they would really be real fighters, they would put their families in a safe place and of fight course. us. Face they want face. us to kill their Guys kids so they can accuse us of being murderers and we fall prey to their monstrous ideology and PR success that they have with Europe and with America and with stupid professors and academics in our universities. And we fall prey. You know, the Jewish people were chosen to teach the world morality. 
instead of us being students of CNN and the New York Times and NYU and Columbia about what's moral and not moral, time has come that the Jewish people should stand up and say, we will teach the world what morality is. For four or 5,000 years, we have died to keep our nation and our world moral. We were the ones who taught the world that every human being, Arab and Jew, black and white, is created in God's image. It's time that we embrace our mandate to be a true light onto the nations. Don't look to the world to smile at you. Oh, 2,000 Jews were killed. We'll give you sympathy for a few weeks. No, let's be the beacons of morality. What's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil. Call a spade a spade. Call a monster a monster. I agree. So we educate the world what morality is by killing them. Is that it? No. <laughs> You got it wrong, completely wrong. You completely uh, Rabbi, off. Completely. Let's make a whole education center for 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 PR for Israel and for the Jewish people. Now, right now, we don't have to apologize for anything we're doing. Right now, we have to act. We don't have to stand stand here and apologize to anyone in the world, not in Europe and not in not in America, or not in in Canada. We have to fight for our country, for our people. We have here in Israel. Nine million people who are living here, including non-Jews, two million non-Jews living here who want to live peacefully, most of them. We have to protect them. And right now, we have to do everything possible. There is no morality or not morality. We're in a war now. They came here invading Israel, killing our women and children, raping women, killing old men and Holocaust survivors. We have to go take care of our enemies. Unfortunately, our enemies are using their people as protection. Their children is protection. We can't do anything about it. They're also using our people for protection. They kidnapped over 100 Jews and having them in their custody. We can't do anything about it. We have to fight our enemies, including, unfortunately, some of our own people and many of their people. Yeah. And shame, and it's shame on all of us, on all of us, that we have allowed years and years and years of a philosophy of such a demonstration of weakness with the best of intentions that emboldened our worst enemies to simply continue murder after murder after murder. I want to say one thing, Rabbi, and I'm going to say this loud. United at Sela. We, during the last 10 days, did not treat one terrorist. Unfortunately, some terrorists got to the hospital, not through United at Sela. I'm not going to say who did, but we did not. Treat one terrorist. We did not take any terrorists to the hospital. Thank you for your sanity. We, Thank you for your sanity. This is, this is humanity. This is humanity. In a situation like this, you see a terrorist on the floor. You leave him on the floor. Let the police deal with them. I hope we would live in a situation where no terrorists would stay alive. These terrorists, I once asked from Chaim Kanievsky. I'm putting this here. It's recorded. I asked from Chaim Kanievsky. They had a situation. The UN, sorry, that. The Red Cross are very involved in Israel. And they had an announcement by one of the officials here in Eretz Yisrael, runs big emergency services, that if they have a situation where you have a terrorist injured and a Jew injured, you have to do triage. And whoever's injured more, you have to treat first. Imagine. Imagine. <laughs> this is a Jew saying this, a Jew saying this. So they asked me as Atzala, what does United Atzala think about it? What is United Atzala's statement about this situation? If you have a terrorist injured by a, a cop who came because he saw the terrorist trying to kill a Jew and the Jew is injured, who do you treat first? So I went to Reb Chaim Kanievsky. I said, you know what? Before I answer you, the answer, I have to, I want to answer God. I was by Reb Chaim Kanievsky for a few questions and I asked him this question. I said, we have a Jew who was stabbed by a terrorist and the Jew was shot, and the terrorist was shot, and he's he's more injured than the Jew. Who do I go first for? You know what Rukhain Ganiaski said to me? You have a chiv to go first to the terrorist. Shoot him in his head and then go to the Jew. <laughs> Very good. Rukhain Ganiaski said this. I don't I wouldn't do it because I'm a medical person. But in a war, I guess Rukhain, where's this where does this come from? You know, he's he's without a gun now, he's 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 injured, he's maybe cuffed. Reb Chaim said he has a din of a roidif. Yeah. These, all of these terrorists, unfortunately, and their families are surrounding and protecting them. 
all these family members who are standing there and protecting them have a din of a roidiv. We're in a war now. We're not in a situation of a hostage and a guy in Manhattan holding a whole family. This is a whole group of millions of, of millions of terrorists in Gaza who want to kill every single one of us, want to kill our children, our mothers, our grandmothers. We now need to protect ourselves. We have zero rahmanas. You remember Norman Schwarzkopf. Norman Schwarzkopf was the commander of the U.S. forces in the first Gulf War, not Jewish. And they asked him, should we forgive terrorists? So General Schwarzkopf said, that's not our job. It's God's job. Our job is to arrange the meeting. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's go to another live question, okay? That one, uh, Rock the Island. I like that. Okay, I'm you. Hi. Um, yeah, so I just, I saw this for myself and I see this from the previous questioner that I think that, and when you listen to what the, the, you know, the news people are saying, I don't know, I'm not like very educated. I don't know so much about it, but if I ever just listen to one person and immediately makes me doubt what the MS is, what the truth is, who's right and who's wrong. That, that question, like I can so relate to it because I started thinking the same way, like maybe I don't know, maybe the Israelis are doing bad things. And the truth is that, that we know the truth and listening to what the world is saying is so detrimental. It literally like just takes us away from what our true mission is, which is to do Hashem's will, to do more mitzvahs, to bring more light into this world and to, to help bring Mashiach closer, to help just like to feed on this unity, to take the unity that came into this world due to what happened and just feed on it. Let's bring more light into this world. Why are we doubting what the Emma is? We know what the Emma is. We know that the Eden are right. We know who Hashem is. We know that we're Hashem's army. How can we even doubt that what we're like, it's only because of, you know, if you, yeah, you expose yourself to what's going on out there, to the opinions of the world then yeah, immediately it makes you doubt. But why are we even going there? Why are we turning on the media? Why are we listening to what they have to say? We know the MS. I think that we need to just focus more on, on that. Like, let's, let's just focus on what our mission is and what, you know, the people who are not on the ground, we know what our mission is. We know that we have to bring more light into the world of Tyra and Metzvah. And I think that that's what we need to do. Like, not- You're right, Libby. Libby, you're a thousand percent right. I just want to add one more thing. And that is, there are tremendous amounts of Jews in positions of influence in America, in Europe, of course, Israel, and around the world. It's not just enough for us to know who we are. We have a, a more important job for those that are capable of this, and God put them in that position. And that is to speak to the world, to be a light unto the nations. You know, on Simchas Torah in Israel, when the attack happened, they were reading Parshas Bereshis. Does anybody know what's the first Rashi? Rashi, the greatest commentator of Torah and history. What's the first Rashi in the whole Chumash? What does Rashi say? The Torah should have started off from the first mitzvah. The whole Bereish, the whole history, creation. Torah is a book of mitzvahs. Give me the mitzvahs. And what does Rashi say? The whole reason why the Torah started off with Bereish is so that the Jews should have an answer to the question. What's the question? One day, Rashi says, the nations of the world are going to come to the Jewish people and say, Listim Atem, you're a bunch of thugs and robbers. You stole our land. You are occupiers. You are foreign colonialists who took our land. And that's when Jews will have an answer. Beresh is Lekim is Hashemayim Vesaritz. You believe in the Bible. You're Christian. You're Muslim. You believe in the Bible. God created the world. He took one little piece of land and he gave it to one people forever and ever and ever. We are not robbers. Now think about this. Rashi lived in the 11th century in France during the first crusade. Even in his wildest dreams, he couldn't imagine Jews settling Israel en masse. The question was the Muslims or the Christians? Who will rule Israel, Christians or Muslims? But Rashi was teaching a five-year-old Jewish child, a five-year-old Jewish child, and every Jewish child older than that. That one day, the world is gonna look at you and say, you are robbers, listimata. And the whole Torah, the whole Sefer Beratius, was written 
and engraved and given to us so that we have an answer, an unwavering, clear answer. This is our land. We have one land in the world, one homeland in the world. We are not thieves. Our position here is as moral as it gets. And therefore, we will defend it and we will not allow monsters to murder our children. This is what every leader of the Jewish people needs to say. This is what the spokesman of Israel has to have to talk about. Enough with the shame and the inferiority complex and relying on the UN to give us legitimacy. Don't rely on the United Nations to give you legitimacy. The only things they could unite about is to condemn Israel. We're going to make you the spokesman of the state of Israel. <laughs> Okay, there's a lot more yeah. questions, a lot more things. Eli, ich bin Meshiga? No, you're 100% right. I agree with you. Everything you say, Rabbi, you are 100%. This is, we don't have to be ashamed to protect our country. We don't you know have how to be much ashamed. confusion would have been avoided. You know how many casualties. We need clarity, decisiveness, resolve. Like they had during the Second World War. Nobody doubted who Hitler was. Why is anybody many, doubting who Hamas is, Iran, Hezbollah? They're Hitlers, Hitlerists. You know, during the war, during the war, the Second World War, they had thousands and thousands of partisans who were very, very cruel to the Nazis. They killed their families. They killed them. No one came in the world and said, how could you do this to the poor Nazis? You killed six children, a Nazi, uh, Adolf uh, Schmidt. From from v, from Vienna, you killed their children. No one cared. You did the right job. You had to protect. You had to save the world. Right now, we have a mission to save Eretz Yisrael, literally save Eretz Yisrael, and save the Jewish nation. And we are the if it, if it's not us, we're the guinea pigs here. After us, if we don't win this war, Chas v'Sholem, this is going to the rest of the world. These guys are not interested to stop in Israel. They want to conquer and literally murder anyone who's not like them. Right. They're going to jump from city to city in Europe. It's right. going to happen. And we need to stop it here and air just yeah. now and not look outside and say, oh, they said this. They said, who cares? Yeah. Who cares? You think during the killing of the Jews, we stop to see what people are thinking? Exactly. We have to right now think about Exactly. <laughs> the stupidest never, thing the Jews believe is they want a Palestinian state. They got a Palestinian state in 2005 and August. They got a beautiful Palestinian state and it would have expanded and expanded. They would have gotten the whole West Bank. They don't want a Palestinian state near Israel. They want a Palestinian state in lieu of Israel. Is that what we, we always Shabana? said? We want, we want peace. They want us in pieces. And this is a, a fact for over the years. You know, people forget what happened in Gaza 20 years ago. 15 years ago. When was Ariel Sharon when he gave Gaza away? To 2005, the August. He That's made a Tisha B'Av and he pushed it up to the 15th day of, of 2005. Tavshin Samachai. 10,000 Jews forcibly how long expelled after, their homes. How long after the Hamas, they murdered all the PLO members? Yeah, they a all year ran later. away like rats. A year these later. Guys, these guys are such hypocrites. I was I was today I was watching some kind of chat that I was in with some Palestinians and pro Palestinians. I I was so upset. I said you guys are sub hypocrites. So Eighteen years ago, when the Hamas were killing you, you were shooting back on any one of them. You were fighting like like dogs, one between each other, and you killed each other. For they killed children. They killed they killed everyone. By the way, no PLO was left in Gaza. All controlled by Hamas. And you guys are attacking now, you're attacking us, you're condemning Israel for, for attacking the ones who were your enemies. And this shows that the hatred towards Jews is so great. Even in Europe, you still have anti-Semites who hate, who hate Judaism so much that when our enemies are attacking us and killing us, these guys are standing and waiting to see when we're going to kill the first Palestinian kid so they could go ahead and condemn us all around the world. The good news is, my friends, the good news is that we have watched every great empire who tried to destroy us crumble. And we are here. And we had a secret weapon that has sustained us for 4,000 years from the day we became a people through thick and thin, 
through sunshine and rainy days, through light and darkness, and we still have that weapon. Number one, Jewish unity, Avas Yisrael, Achtos Yisrael. Number two, Torah and mitzvahs. And then Hashem wants us to use nature, natural natural power, an army, a Hatzalah, an intelligence. But we have to remember that this is a time of resolve and confidence. Yes, we have fear. Yes, we have pain, no question. I don't think all of us have fear, but some of us have a lot of fear and all of us have a lot, a lot of pain. But I want to translate that pain into resolve, into actions, into empowerment. Everybody, as we said, is on the front lines. I have to ask myself, what is my mission now? Whether it's going to the front lines in Gaza, whether it's Torah, whether it's Tefillah, whether it's Taka, whether it's Mitzvahs, whether it's Chuba, whether it's doing a favor to another person, whether it's Avis Yisrael, Achdis Yisrael. Today, by the way, there's an unbelievable opportunity to help Jews come closer to their true essence, to their Judaism and to their Jewish essence, because everyone is touched in ways that is unprecedented. Seize that opportunity. Everybody has influence. The Hisairus, the inspiration today in Israel, from people you wouldn't expect. Well, why, why, I'm traveling something now. holy. I'm traveling, huh? what? I'm traveling now. I'm traveling now. And there's I'm by Chabad, uh, place I was eating supper. A bunch of not from people walked in randomly and they said, Can you please put the film on today? Yeah. It's it's incredible. Incredible. Nobody it's asked. Nobody incredible. asked. Incredible. And I want to say something. We have here a few thousand people listening. Every single one of you has a relative, a friend, a business partner, an employer, an employee, a neighbor, somebody you know from the gas station. Everyone today has a shlichus. If every one of us does one thing to influence another Jew besides ourselves, of course, and our families and our children, a revolution can happen, a spiritual revolution can happen. Whether it's tefillin, or it's kashrus, or it's mezuzah, or it's mikveh, or it's shabbos, or it's chinuch, or it's tzedakah, or it's avos yisrael, or it's saying shema yisrael, or it's davening in Israel and around the world. There's an unbelievable opportunity. Seize the opportunity. Don't be embarrassed. Jews want to connect. Everybody wants to do something. Not everybody can go drive a tank in Gaza. Not everybody is part of Zaka and Hevri Kaddish and United Atzala. Some people are jobs and people have responsibilities. But everybody wants to do something. Seize the opportunity. Seize the opportunity. I want to tell you, with the I, help I, of somebody, and I'm, I want to let, leave the, the give the platform. Tell you, with the help of somebody, there's a, a there's, there's something you could send. It's called one mitzvah.org slash Israel slash Rabbi Y Y Jacobson that I created with somebody. You could send it to any secular Jew with a choice of mitzvahs they can accept. One mitzvah.org slash Israel slash Rabbi Y Y Jacobson, and you could send this to any person you want, and it's a hisayrus. Let's help Eretz Yisrael. How can I help Eretz Yisrael? With money? Yes. With food? Yes. With moral support? Yes. With everything physical that they need? Yes. And then we have the eternal weapon of Klal Yisrael. The eternal weapon of Klal Yisrael is... Is holiness. It's love. It's Torah. It's Torah and it's mitzvahs. You know, Rabbi... Let's not drop the ball. Don't drop the ball. I, I want to talk about uh, one one story before I end because it's 7 a.m. almost here in Eretz Yisrael. Um, I was in Far Aza the morning after, and it was devastating. And all of a sudden, a young guy comes over to me, a young man, definitely not a religious Jew, and he walks over to me and he says, if I'm hungry, he has food. I said, no, no, give it to the soldiers. He was giving away sandwiches he made. I said, give it away to soldiers. And I said to him, sorry, this was in, yeah, it was Faraza. He says, I said to him, give it to, he said, no, I have enough. I have enough. I want to give you two. I tell, I want to give you two. I said, where are you from? Where are you from? I want to know. He's coming from all over. He says, I'm from the kibbutz next door, Barry. He's from Barry. Barry was a terrible massacre there. Terrible massacre. I said, you, the, the morning after you're making sandwiches, giving, he says, I decided I want to do good deeds. I, after what I saw last night, I was miraculously yeah. saved. He was saved. He said, I decided to take a mitzvah on myself and do good deeds, like you said before. And he was going around after what he went through and going around giving people food. And I don't know if it was kosher or not. I didn't end up eating because I was not eating anything for days after. But he was giving around food that he made 
just because he wanted to do a mitzvah. And I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to, to pick up a mitzvah. Find a mitzvah you don't do. Uh, there was many mitzvahs we forget about. And we should, uh, first of all, after the Racha Kamokha is the greatest mitzvah we could do. And uh, any other mitzvah you pick up on the way, you like, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that website and send it out to a few of my friends. OneMitzvah.org slash Israel. I just say it a little bit. I know we're talking about what we could do for Kali Yisrael and what we do for ourselves. But I think on a, on a more personal note, I think most of us, one way or another, we have things that are unresolved that live inside of us, relationships that are unresolved, fractures, hurt, pain. And I think, I know for myself, going into Shabbos, like there's a little bit, you know, you give a, a bracha to your children Friday night, and there's a, a little bit more, a little bit more sincerity, a little bit more care, a little bit more I love you and good Shabbos, because you realize when, when we're being attacked and things that we, we seem to take for granted are being threatened, we start looking back and say, okay, what truly matters to us as people? I think it's also a time not just to give to others, um, but also to give to ourselves, to give to ourselves the opportunity to say what truly matters to us. And when you think about what matters, it's relationships, it's our bonds, it's our connections. And some of us have deeply fractured bonds, even with our own parents, sometimes with our own children. It's an opportunity to take, like, take stock and reflect and say, maybe there's an opportunity here to try to resolve some of that, to try to engage another where we could find some forms of love that have been missing in our own hearts. It's just an opportunity. It's a wake up call for all of us to like take stock. What truly matters to us? I just want to say this out loud because Esther, I, I thought your question was deeply sensitive and beautiful. And I know there are many of us who also have such questions. I think we are a, a nation of compassionate people. And that was a compassionate question. We need to get truly, truly educated. They say what when you have a fight, that's a moral equivalent. You could start asking questions like, they killed our children. Is it, is it okay to kill their children? And God forbid we approach things that way. It's never okay. Any loss of life is not okay. Um, but we're not on the same page. We need to know our history. We need to understand that this is a nation that's trying to push us into the sea. And we could say this with full honesty and a full heart, that we know that our people, our nation, would never deliberately try to harm a child, ever. It would never, ever happen because that's not who we are. It's something that, that happens, and our heart breaks that it happens. But it's not because we want it to happen. It's what we call collateral damage. That's the only thing. But I think that the question is a, a deeply Jewish question, and I'm proud to be a part of the nation that asks such a question. We need to continue to ask it. Yeah, we need to answer it as well. We need to answer it because there are answers. We're not at an, a, a, a moral equivalent with this enemy. We're not. It's a different state of mind where we're being attacked, and we're trying to protect ourselves. It's a very different story. Beautiful. Okay, let's let's go to close and let's everybody give a little wrapping. I know let, let Ellie go first if he's first. Ellie, I'm just from the text, the people that text me. People want to hear one more chizik story, if you could think of one. And the question that people keep on asking is now that everything is tense and we do see Klai Yisrael, whether in Israel or America, coming close, what can you tell people that when things must calm down, that we keep that same thing and we don't go back to uh, the left and the right and uh, you know all that stuff? How do we Keep that when things are not at war. Those are the two things I'm asking you to close with. Well, first of all, I want to ask everyone here to make reservations to come for Pesach, to Eretz Yisrael, Mitzvah Hashem. It's all going to be behind us, Pesach time. So if you want to have a nice time in Eretz Yisrael, you're going to see Achtas like you never saw before. I really think it's going to take a couple of months, but this is something that I really hope that the same way the Holocaust is something we talk about all the time, the Shoah. This is something that we will all remember in Eretz Yisrael. And I think everyone here knows why this thing happened. And all happened because of Sinus Chinam. And I really hope this is going to be a memorial for Sinus Chinam. We should talk about this. Is, this should be part of the education in schools. I'm, I'm really putting it as part of my agenda as United Hatzalah to speak about this in front of ministers and, 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 and government officials, that something has to be done in terms of education for Ahavas Yisrael. I don't know how to do this. You, you are big educators. You can teach this in America. And uh, I, will, I will focus this as part of the mission here. 
And I really, I personally, I'm going through a very hard time. As I told you, my son Israel is in the army now. And he's a wonderful kid. I have two, four beautiful daughters who are giving me a lot of nachas. I have four grandchildren. And um, I'm really, really excited about always, every time I'm coming back home. And I can't wait for my son to come back safe from, from this battle. But we're all in it together. And, and the only way to win it is if we really take care of it once and for all. We need all the davening from all of you. All the davening we need. And all the tzedakah, I, I really hope you all support good causes. And of course, United Hatzalah is very, very important. So if you could share our link, it'll be very, very important. We need support to buy more bulletproof vests, more helmets, more bags of medical supplies, more ambulances. We're buying things we never bought before, armed ambulances, Hatzalah, armed ambulances, which is never something we, we never did before. And unfortunately, we have to prepare ourselves. But I'm optimistic. More than all, I'm very optimistic. First of all, hearing you and think, seeing thousands of people coming to here and getting chizik. This gives me chizik. I came to give chizik, but I got chizik from all of you. And I went through some tough times the last 10 days that I was really depressed. But I came out stronger than ever. And uh, I want to thank all of you for doing this beautiful Evening for you and morning for me. And I love you all. Um, Ellie, everybody wants to have your son's name and we want to say Capitol Hill while you're still on and then we want to continue before you sign off. Can we do that? Yeah, let's yes. say Capitol Thank Hill you. for Ellie's son and for all of the soldiers. All the soldiers. I'm not all my son. My son is one. Son. Son. My son is strong. And your son. And all of and all of the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael. And of course, all the wounded and all the captive all those in captivity and all the families of the slain and the wounded and the captivity. Let's say a couple of for everybody. Ellie, what's your son's name? Let's go. Let me tell you a short story about my son you love. If you remember in Yerushalayim, 20 years ago, they had a doctor by the name of David Applebaum. He was yeah. a tzaddik shen Yeah. And his, his daughter was supposed to get married. And uh, this was September... September 9th. His daughter was supposed to get married September 10th. And he went with his daughter Nava to a coffee shop in Emek Rafaim in Yerushalayim, in a cafe called Cafe Hillel. And that coffee shop blew up with a terrorist that walked in. And David and his daughter Nava were in the coffee shop having coffee together the night before her wedding. A disaster. The whole Amisrael was, every Jew in the world was devastated. I was one of the first medics who arrived as Hatzel. I came on a motorcycle there. David was a very close friend of mine. Uh, we were very close with the Sands. David's daughter was supposed to marry Hanan Sand, Tzvi Sands' daughter, son. And I was, I saw David on the floor. I couldn't believe it's him. I was like shocked. He was such a tzaddik, that guy. I did shifts on the ambulances with him. He was, he was, a, he was a very, very close friend. And I saw a member of Hatzel. And Shari Tzedek and Magen David, and he was like very involved with saving lives. All of a sudden, I see him on the floor dead. And then after a few minutes, I realized his daughter is right there. We're trying to save her. I was like devastated. And I went home so depressed. My wife was in labor then. And three days later, my wife gave birth to a baby boy. It's my first boy. And I told my wife, I want to call him after David Applebaum. And my wife said, listen, let's ask a Shaila about this. I went to the biggest maven in names he was uh the chief rabbi of israel or mordechai liyahu this is by the way my book called 90 seconds i forgot to promote my book called 90 seconds by art school rabbi i don't know if you read i'm going to give you a book so you read it it's an incredible book it's it's, it's inspired so many you No, know, i like you i like you because you're here for a few hours and you forgot to promote your book Continue. I forgot <laughs> completely. I'm talking about the war and this and that. I forgot even about a website, IsraelRescue.org. I forgot about it. Um, so so um, my, I went to a Mordechai Eliyahu, who was the, a big godly. He was a big maven in Kabbalah and everything. And he said, he, he loved this. Uh, he says, listen, you need to change the order. Mordechai, your son, uh, Mord, uh, David Applebaum's name was David Yaakov. Change the order to Israel David. 
and he's going to be matzliach, he's going to have a long life, he's going to be successful. Yeah. So I know Rav Mordechai Eliyahu gave my son a bracha. I would love to give a bracha tonight to my son. He's giving me a lot of nachis, and he's a big, he's a big maimin. He does everything in Amuna, and he's fighting in one of the most elite forces of the Israeli army. And he worked very hard to get in that unit. It's a, it's a secret unit, and um, his name is Israel David Ben. Hi, uh, Ben Gittel. Do I say his a mother's name, right? The mother's name. Yeah. And but but it's not he's he's Baruch Hashem fine, but together with all the Chayalim, together with all the Hatzala members. Okay. I Rabbi Wallah, before you start, I, I put a Google a, a Google Doc on the chat for everybody. This uh, 170 names of the captives that the people have, I put on the oh. chat. Anybody could download it, open that Google Doc, and Rabbi Rabbi Wallah, with with uh, all the thousands of people that are here. Okay, so if you can open up a Tehillim, or if you know it by heart, we'll say together, Kapitel Kufchav Aleph and Kapitel Kufchav Beis in Tehillim, okay? Please, everybody, share with me for, the, for our soldiers, for our brothers and sisters, for all of the families, and for all of our people. Kufchav Aleph. Give me a second, Rebbe Wabba, give me a second, give me a second. Give me a second. Uh, Tehillim, Chabad, Kufchav Aleph, one twenty-one. 121 and 122. Give me one second. So I'll put on the screen and everybody can see it. Hold on one second. 121, 122. Okay. Hine lo yonum velo yishon shame Yisrael. Adinoi shemrecha, adinoi tzilchal yad yiminecho. Yoimam hashemesh lo yakeko v'yoreyach baloi lo. Adinoi yishmor chomikol ro. Yishmor es nafshecho. Adinoi yishmor tzeischo v'yecho. Me'ato v'ad oilom. Kuf chov beiz. 122. Shir Hamalois Ladovit, Samachti, Boim Rimli Base, Adenoi Nelech, Oim Doi Soyuraglenu, Bisharai, Hirushaloyim, Yerushalayim, Abnuyo, Kir Shehubraloyach, Dov Shesham, Alushvotim, Shifti, Yo Edus Lisroel, Loi Doi Slashem Adenoi, Kishama Yosh, Vuchisus, Lumishpot, Kisus, Leves David, Shalu Shloim, Yerushaloyim, Yishloyu, Oyavoyich, Yehi shalom b'chelech shalva bar menoy soich leman achai v'reyo yadabra no shalom boch leman beis adinoy leheinu avaksha toiv loch. Again, I'm also to mention again before Elliot. Just give me one more second. Again, it's a, it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that obviously you know that in school of the Torah and me and Menachem we live in Lakewood and obviously the Torah supports thousands of young people that are learning. And there's a big campaign for everybody to be part of it. Give a small amount, a dollar, whatever it is. There is always muscle, cholesterol, in all situations. And that is the ultimate source, as we all know. And I'm putting the link over here. Obviously, we're going to send it out. But everybody, let's try to, you know, one mitzvah day, Rabbi Wow, we're going to add to the email. Adir Atera. Eli, you did the one mitzvah day today. You're machazic thousands and thousands. Of so you, did, you accomplished the YWAS mitzvah day today. So, Eli, thank you for coming on. And we're going to Eli, we love you. Chazag ve'amatz. Continue to inspire so and continue to be the leader that you are for so many and to do it with Menuchas HaNefesh and Menuchas HaGuf. I want to tell you, Rabbi, one thing before I leave, that I every night I watch a short video about you. I don't watch any TV. I don't watch anything, but I love watching your speeches on the short YouTube things. You're incredible. You give me you speak so well. You mechazek so many people. And I'm a person who has very little patience. And to watch your short shorties, I don't know what they're called. I don't know how I got into it. Every night to, to relax my brain before I go to sleep, I end up watching a few of your, your short videos. So I just want to say thank you. Um, it really helps. You think if I watch me. my own videos, I can relax my brain too? Or it only works for other people? Only you watch other people. Is it, and the other watches your is it? I'll watch you my, watch my book. You read my book, 90 seconds. And I'll relax my brain. 
you relax it. You you'll love, you laugh, you love, you laugh, you'll you'll cry. It's it's an incredible story. How I raised money to buy the first motorcycle. It's incredible the story. And uh Baruch Hashem. Ellie and, and I and had to close this past Hanukkah at Memila to light the public menorah and dance together. And may you and all of us continue to light flames of love and light and hope and courage. Yeah, and, and if anyone wants also, to... I think we can learn from this also. You mentioned this. It's very important to relax our brains. We cannot uh, change the world for the better and change ourselves for the better when we're in a state of disarray <laughs> and panic. We need to be anchored in something very powerful. So ask yourself, what can anchor you these days in an emotional and mental space that will allow you to be the best version of yourself? that will allow you to radiate unity and love and compassion, that will allow you to become the ambassador of the Jewish people and of Hashem in today's day. To be anchored is, is, is really critical. But Ali, thank well, you well, for your very- I must very say that your jokes, your jokes usually are incredibly funny. And I was like thinking once, you know, I do events for Atzala to bring you as a comedian, not only as a rabbi, you always have the greatest openings for every everything you start with a good joke. So I want to say shkayach. And before I leave, I'm sorry. I'm going to give I'm going to give you the pulpit. I just want to mention, if someone wants to support United Atzala, go on to IsraelRescue.org. IsraelRescue.org. The reason we don't say United Atzala is because so many people by mistake go into Hezbollah's website and donate. <laughs> it's so confusing. I'm not kidding. I have a lot of people who are not from. Who live in Idaho and I don't know where they send us check friends of Hezbollah all the time, I and I have people saying, Shkoyach, they say to me, I love the work Hezbollah is doing. You're doing such Ellie, a good the job. Is that the right link, Ellie? Is that the right link in the chat? I don't know if they donate. Yeah, probably IsraelRescue.org. Donate, and even, you know, you should donate to Torah, and donate to saving lives, and and we'll right. together. Be able okay, to. So tonight, next year, we got three things: donate to Adirei Torah to support Torah, donate to Israel uh, United Atzala, and do one mitzvah a day from Rabbi Yaiy. And if we, we're all going to do that together, all thousands and thousands of people. We're going to see the war over, and we'll be in Metz Seminary to Israel before Hanukkah. Okay, you know what? I was thinking about Pesach. If you want to make Hanukkah, you have to donate another few dollars, and you'll get there in Hanukkah. Does it come with the full package, like with the dessert and everything? You come for dinner. We're going to go to Mamila to light a candle with the rabbi. And then you come for dinner to me. I want to ask, I want to ask Akiva if you can leave us with. One second, one second, one second. I just want to say goodbye to Ellie. There's, there's a <clears> lot <throat> okay, Ellie, you're thank tzaddik. You. Thank you. Thank you so and, much. Thank you. Okay, we have thank a lot you, of everyone. <clears throat> okay, you hi, how are you? Oh. Hello? Yeah, hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, my question is like, I'm dealing with a lot of different, you know, personal challenges in my life right now. I feel like this whole situation in Israel came like, to invalidate all my challenges and everything that I'm dealing with. And I'm walking around in tremendous pain from the things that I'm dealing with. And at the same time, tremendous guilt for feeling the pain. I want to know, like, how do I stop feeling so guilty for my own problems? Or like, how do I find a balance? You know? Yeah. Akiva, the Akiva. Ah, we should know that if you're you're hurting, you're allowed to hurt even during time of crisis in Klal Yisrael. You're allowed to feel pain. You're allowed to struggle. I think one of the things we learn from this, like they're trying to take away our individuality. We're all seen as one. It's just one individual. Yet in reality, we're all very unique people, beautiful in our own right. And if you're going through a hard time, honor that hard time. Try to find a way to, to take that energy and say, what could I do for other people? But if you're in your experience, you're in your experience. We're allowed to. We're allowed to be there. Like Rabbi Wawa was saying before, we need to find some way to ground ourselves during this time. My sister, I'll just leave you with one story. My sister, as she was doing the Tahara, um, in for, for all these unfortunate, you know, the Mason, our brothers and sisters, and she said there's a room for the people who are doing Tahara to go collect themselves, to, to find a moment so they could breathe because they need that. We all need that. And she walks into the room, which is sort of like this quiet enclave for you to find yourself again. And she sees in that room several boxes of pizza. And her initial response was pizza, 
during Tahara, like, what are we doing? How are we doing this? And there was another woman who was sitting in the room eating some of that pizza. And she said, don't let them take away your need to, to eat, to enjoy what you're eating, to survive, to take care of yourself. And we still don't always need to remember that. We need to take care of ourselves during these times. Find ways to do that. Even though it feels selfish, it feels like we're doing something wrong. But in order for us to be at our full strength, we have to ultimately take care of who we are as people and reach out, get the help that you need, get the connections that you need. And we'll all, we're all in this together, but there's nothing wrong with being human during a time of deep humanity. This is where we are. And uh, we're in it together, which is a beautiful thing. Dr. Kiva, I want you to end with a closing. I want your closing to really encompass. Hey, may I add a, a 60 second uh, comment to what Rabbi Akiva just said? Sure. I want to just add one detail. And that is, it may feel selfish, but it's really, really the exact opposite of that. And I'll tell you why. The more you take care of yourself, the more your relationships become stronger, the more your attachment is healed, the closer you can feel to your soul, to your body, to your God, to your family, to your loved ones, the better version of yourself you will be the more of your inner light you will radiate and the more you will be able to fulfill your mission, which is going to help the whole Jewish people and Israel and the world. So it's not like you're in, you also have to indulge in yourself. What Dr. Perlman is telling us is not only that you're allowed to do it, of course, it's even more than that by each and every one of us. If, when you're taking care of yourself, you're taking care of God's child. You're taking care of a royal princess. You're taking care of a chelik elikami ma. You're fighting Hamas. You're taking care of a soul. You're nurturing a soul. Uh, I once heard from the from the, the Rebbe. He said something very powerful. He said, "There's the Jewish people, and there's Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael to the Jewish people is like the body to the soul. We need to protect the borders of Eretz Yisrael, and we have to protect the borders of our own body, because our body is our Eretz Yisrael. That's where your neshama dwells. That's where your shechina dwells. You're a beis hamikdash." And your Beis Hamikdash is your Neshama in your body. These are the borders of your Beis Hamikdash. When you protect the borders of your body and you allow the right energy to come into you so that you can radiate the right energy, you are protecting your piece of Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael exists physically and spiritually. And that allows all of us to protect our Eretz Yisrael. And that allows our brothers and sisters to protect the cosmic Eretz Yisrael. Dr. Perman, I, Dr. Perman, I just wanted to end with one with one thought that I know you covered a little bit, but I wanted to just bring it up again. Just the human emotion as we go through all this right now, right? Just grounding ourselves and grounding, obviously grounding ourselves will automatically ground our children and being, you know, it's very interesting to always preach to our children about the Holocaust and the Jews and how we survived and how amazing we are, all in theory. But now that we're actually living it in reality and our children have to go into the world and deal with anti-Semitism and see the things that are going on and the exposure is great. How do we, practical, just simple, practical, how do we ground ourselves in these unstable situations, in these scary situations, and how do we give that over to our children? And ultimately, really, I'm, I'm getting into is actually the Munu Bataka question. How do we do that so well for ourselves that we automatically give it over to our children so they feel that sense of, as Rabbi Russell says, safe, secure, seen, and soothed? Oh. Beautiful words from Rev Russell. It's nice to bring him into this room, and I like this. The um, one thing we need to know that it's we're you're, we're in something. We're not at the end of it, looking back and reflecting and thinking back. What are the messages we want to give over? And our children are looking at us for direction, for clarity. And in order for us to give them that, we need to first and foremost take care of ourselves. Acknowledge that whatever we feel is acceptable. It's okay especially and if we're feeling very anxious, which many people are, like we need to find a way to attend to that anxiety. Um, and that, and everyone has their own way. We're not gonna get into like the, 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 the fine details of how we deal with our anxiety, but it's an anxious time. And anxiety is, is almost the body's response telling us that there's a problem and there is a problem. We're in a problem and we're doing it collectively together. But in order for us to, to give over that message to our children, we first and foremost need to learn how to take care of ourselves. And I think tonight is one of the best ways that we're taking care of ourselves. Not only that, just like going in and figuring out what is my unique way to give? What is my essence? What is my way of expressing myself in this world, especially during a time of crisis? And by doing, it soothes the soul. 
By doing, it makes us feel like we're engaging in something, we're participating in something, we're using the gifts that Hashem gave us in order to live in the world in a better way. And I think we need to get together more often. That's my take. Usher, Coach Menachem, this is something we got to do a few times a week for Klal sake, just so we could see one another and we could ask each other questions that we don't necessarily have answers for, but we could simply ask and then have someone attend to them and say, okay, I'm here with you. I'm here with you in the struggle. And that's what we do. And I think what we, we try to do as best as we can is when there's a threat that's coming at us, think about what the threat is and then dig in deep and say, how could I provide an antidote? If they're coming after us and, and, and saying that because we're Jewish, it's an opportunity to dig into our Yiddishkeit and say, how lucky are we to be a part of this? If they're coming after us and they're trying to tear us apart, And even within our own families, it's a great opportunity for us to to love and our families even more than we do to say, you're so precious to me. It's an opportunity because now we know what the threat actually is. They don't discriminate and we can't discriminate. Not certainly not for one another. And it's an opportunity for us to be together. Um, But we need to take care of ourselves. That's the best way we do it. You know, and we all know how to do that in, in, in some strange way. And if we don't, we need to reach out to the people that could help us with it. Jiva, you know I love you. I um, want to say a comment, this is a personal comment. Everybody should understand this. You can see this from Ellie Beer. I want to let you know, Rabbi Waiwai, you could say, hey, this is Emma Sanat. Rabbi Waiwai, we decided to put together this year literally months before Shabbos. And then today, I had no, I, I'm traveling, I'm busy, I had no time for anything. And I had to reach out to Rabbi Dr. Kiva and Ellie Beer was <laughs> impossible to get all of. And the thought is, and you can see this from Ellie Beer, when you want to do something and you have the Ratzin, Hashem will give you the So everybody, whatever you can do to help somebody, even if you think it's a little bit beyond you, do it. Push yourself, put your mindset to it, and God will give you the help you need to get. We've been doing this for four years. We have no idea how we do this. <laughs> we have no idea how it works out. Right? Yeah, well, it started you know? during Corona. started during Corona. And it's been an incredible journey. It's been an incredible journey. So Dr. Kiva, thank you for everything. And I just want to mention again, because Dr. Kiva just mentioned it, again, for people that do need more physic, I'm a big chassid of Yochanan and Fresh Start, and I have very personal gears with him. He's doing a four-thing seminar with the biggest therapist, you know, Dr. Uh, Rabbi Wawe knows all the people therapy with Ken Adams and Fisher and Dr. Ruth and Dr. Dr. Van Brussel, who wrote the, probably the best-selling book on Amazon. Um, Join us October 16th, 18th, 22nd, 24th. He showed in the beginning of the program. You can go to jewishfreshstart.com. There's the webinar program. So over the next week, if you need more of these trauma, physics type of things, He's bringing on the really the best of the best, and Im Menachem will email that as well. Akiva, thank you, Rabbi Wawa. I'm going to turn to you for a second. Give us the closing after. I don't even I don't even need to preface it. We were here for three hours with thousands of people. Give us the closing that we, we need to hear. May I be a channel to uh, share what has to be shared. There's a famous Pasuk that Moshe Rabbeinu says at the end of his life, we say it Shabbos. Moshe tells the Jewish people that after all of their long, challenging history, the blood of every single Jew will be claimed, will be avenged. V'chiper ad amoy. So Rashi says, Hashem is going to appease his land and his people. V'chiper, he's going to appease for all the pain that the land went through, the earth went through, Eretz Yisrael, and the people went through. And it doesn't even say v'chiper ad v'amai, the land and the people. He will appease the land, the people, because the Jewish people and the land are one. Meirosh Tzuri Meirenu, Bilam says, I see him from the top of the mountain. So the Svasema says, Bilam says, as I look at the mountains and mounds of Eretz Yisrael, I see engraved in the rock and the soil of Eretz Yisrael, I see Neshama Yisrael, the land and the people are organically, spiritually and physically, geographically and mystically, deeply connected. This is a story that's much, much bigger than us. It's much larger than us. We also know that every year we get closer and closer to the Gula. We thought the greatest pain of Gullus was behind us. And today we can already usher in the Gula with much more comfort and prosperity and serenity. 
but we don't know the mysteries of Golos and Gula. What we do know is that this is a time to hold on to each other tighter than ever. We need to be able to be open and vulnerable and raw. Let's face it, we are an opinionated people. We know how to be divisive. We know how to disagree with each other. We know how to fight with each other like nobody else. We know how to bicker. We know how to prove that you're wrong and I'm right and God is on my side and not on your side. Your minig is stupid and my minig is sacred. We're all good at it. In the secular community, in the religious community, in the very religious community, we're all very, very good at it. Israel is a great example of that. But today I think we were torn at the core and we have to respond with our core and whenever we respond with our core there's so much attachment there is so much love there is so much clarity there is so much confidence there's so much decisiveness and the reason is because we have confusion but not at our core at your core at my core i can swear to you there's no confusion and the reason there's no confusion is because your core is aligned with the source of truth your core is aligned with infinity. In fact, your core is an embodiment of infinity. It's a chelik elekamimah. This is a time for a lot, a lot of inner work and outer work to be able to stay aligned with our core in your marriages, in your relationships with yourselves, with your children, with your loved ones, with your avoidus Hashem, and with everyone you come in contact. And let's face it, the crisis, God willing, will wane. Normal days are going to come. Great days are going to come. The future of the Jewish people is as bright as ever. We need to work on ourselves that as time goes on, we don't lose the positive clarity, the sense of urgency and confidence and beauty that we found in ourselves and in our brothers and sisters during this time. There's a, a vart I once saw from the Kajnitz Magid, the Helika Kajnitz Magid. He says that Hashem cursed Cain, the first murder of history, to be a Navinad, Navinad Tiyabarit. You're going to be wandering around the world. So he says, why? Just buy a house and stay there and you won't wander. And the Kajnitz Magid says, he doesn't mean geographically, he means mentally. Cain will not have a day without anxiety. This is what the Kajnitz Magid writes 250 years ago. Anxiety will pursue him internally. He could be anywhere in the world. He could be at the most beautiful beach, at the most beautiful spa, but the internal anxiety will constantly pursue him. And the Medrash says that God saved Cain by giving him an ice. What was the ice? Shabbos. As God says, what's Shabbos? He says, Shabbos is that you're really connected to God. And when you're connected to God, so your anxiety can relax a little bit because you're anchored in something that is infinite and absolute, but it's a gift, it's a gift. And I think we all need to learn that gift. A lot of us have issues with Hashem because of the pain of life. But ultimately, if we can try to heal it with ourselves and with each other, it's going to be our source of comfort and faith and, and fortitude. Whenever you find yourself, whenever I find myself, I meet a lot, a lot of people and I get letters from a lot of people and I hear a lot of opinions. And a lot of them I really disagree with. You may have noticed that I have some opinions about a few things. And, uh, and I find myself becoming judgmental. Like, I find myself becoming judgmental. And I always know if I'm hearing the voice of judgmentalism, I am not anchored in my neshama. <laughs> I'm anchored in my ego. When I'm anchored in my ego, I need to feel better than you. And the way I feel better than you is by saying, Mr. You're too left-wing, you're too right-wing, you're too detached, you're too attached, you don't get it, you're this. I'm not, I'm not in the place where, where I really am. And this is a time to be able to go to those places. We can have opinions, we can have different opinions too. I don't think all Jewish differences of opinions are going to end. But go from a place of neshama, of divinity, and then everything is different. Because then I don't need you to be wrong for me to be right. What I need more than anything else is that I should feel attached to you and you should feel attached to me. That's our deepest need. That's the need of the soul. That's not the need of the ego. And finally, it's a very powerful time to connect with family. Sit with your children around the dining room. You don't have to say much. Just listen. Be there. Get rid of the phone. Every You need a few hours in the day. No phone. No phone. Even not my clips. Let Ellie Bear watch my clips. Get rid of the phone. Sit at the dining room table, sit at the couch, cry, laugh, make jokes, 
make latkes. I don't care if you make uh, rice crispy fluff. My wife doesn't allow it. It's not healthy. But I don't care if you do rice crispy fluff together. Listen to each other. Laugh together. Play a game. Sing songs. Singing is very healing. Singing is very healing. Breath work. Somatic work. Physical work. Emotional work. Spiritual work. And if you have a mindset that is productive, you will see it will be much easier. So this is a time to connect to our children. As, as, as Dr. Perlman said, our children will forever remember how we responded at this time. Right? What do they say in English? You want to give your children good memories, but it's not just semantics. It's very, very important. We need to be able to be present for each other and for our loved ones in the profoundest way. And that happens through listening, through attentiveness, through connection, through celebrating life. Let's use these moments to teach our children our deepest priorities, our deepest values, not through words, through tears and through song and through prayer and through love. Thank you. Coach Menachem, let's go after three hours. Um, I just want to thank you. I'm sitting here, Mamish, listening to this powerful, powerful night. And yes, I believe we do need to do this more often. We are in a vulnerable state, and um, we don't really know how to do this. And by having you, Rabbi Jacobson and Akiva, thank you so much for just being there for us so we can sit and talk. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, to be able to figure out what's clarity. We have so many questions, and this is what we need for so many years, doing, doing the same thing over and over. And then one day we're like, what in the world are we doing? And then we get some clarity. We ask Hashem that it should come only through positive ways and not these ways. And Mr. Hashem, with tefillah, Torah, and all the things that we heard tonight, we should be zoicha to see the geula step by step, day by day, by day by day, Mr. Hashem. Amen, amen. Something Go just ahead. popped into my head, Rebosh, I'm sorry. I don't want, my son always oh. tells me, Tati, you hog the mic. So I need permission before I hog the mic again. I did, I, I needed something today for myself mentally and emotionally. Um, just because of my position and what's been going on the last week with emails and questions and calls and you know soldiers on the front lines reaching out. So I just needed some healing myself today. And, uh, and I went to a friend and we did some breathing, which was very helpful. And at the, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. And I was crying a lot. At the end, I started to laugh like a Meshugana. And I didn't know why. Nobody made a joke. There was nothing funny about it. I just started to laugh. It was some type of, I don't know, cosmic or comic release. Maybe it's the same thing. And I don't know, somebody popped into my head and I said, ah, that's Pshat. I wasn't laughing because of a joke. There was just something like, I, I think I thought I touched something very deep in myself. And the only way it could be expressed was through uninhibited laughter. And then I realized maybe that's exactly what Geula looks like on a cosmic level, that we're going to touch a place of reality and everything is just going to be converted into laughter, not because the pain is not significant or the horrific, horrific losses are not significant. It's because we'll just be able to touch something so real and infinite inside all of us that there will be this explosion of joy that we can't even imagine when we're stuck in a very narrow state of consciousness. So I just want to pray and hope that all of us can experience that, especially our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land and those who suffered so much directly to be able to experience the Ozi Mali Shaykh Pino Shanein when all of the darkness will be converted into eternal laughter. Amen, amen. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you again, everyone. Truly thank, you, Rebusher, thank you to Thank you to Thank I'm you. I'm telling you, everybody. The facilitator. Today, the facilitator. Today was 100 percent Hashem. Menachem Maskin? Like every week. <laughs> today, <laughs> That's today you saw it. Today I could say Shaykh <laughs> Pinu. Good night, everybody. See you next week in Israel. Take care. Amen.